Welcome to the 9th URM College of Medicine Alumni Association Incorporated 9th Annual Convention Usapang Pinoy Doktor, a webcast series. Before we begin today's program, let's start with an invocation to be led by the UERM Chorus Medicus, followed by the Philippine National Anthem and the UERM Hymn.
Good day everyone. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome everyone to the 51st UERM MMCI College of Medicine Alumni Homecoming Celebrations. It is the time of the year again when we all converge, come together as one family, and be in one again with our alma mater to mark our successful passage in its hallowed hallways and be conferred the honorable degree of Doctor of Medicine. This year's homecoming will have several milestones. First is that we'll be having our first Diamond Jubilarians, the very first graduates of the class of 1961, who will be marking 60 sparkling years as alumni. We'll also be having our very first virtual homecoming celebrations. The prevailing COVID pandemic has been a very big challenge in holding this year's activities. But the Silver, Silver Jubilarians of Class 1996, together with the other celebrating classes and the alumni office, has been constantly meeting the past months to find ways to continue holding the festivities, making it meaningful and memorable. We eventually decided with two segments to the homecoming celebrations, a virtual program which will kick off the festivities this February, followed by a series of online activities. Then a second segment will be held in October, especially for the alumni awards, convocation ceremonies, and gala night, in the hope that we can hold it physically in each other's joyful company. Such is the spirit of our alumni. Despite the difficult situation, the eagerness and longing to be with our alma mater, to reminisce, and to celebrate with classmates and co-alumni is just too strong. We will continue to sparkle like the gems that we are and light up the dark. Let me welcome and congratulate then the Jubilarians who will be shining brightly this year. Class 1996, they are going back and giving back to their alma mater this year by being the main celebrants and sponsors for these homecoming celebrations. Class 1971, the Golden Jubilarians. Class 1961, the Diamond Jubilarians. Class 1966, Emerald Jubilarians. Class 1976, Sapphire Jubilarians. Class 1981, Ruby Jubilarians. Class 1986, Coral Jubilarians. Class 1991, Pearl Jubilarians. Class 20, 2001, China Jubilarians. And then Class 2006, the Crystal Jubilarians. Class 2011, the Teen Jubilarians, and Class 2016, the Wood Jubilarians. I would also like to welcome Class 2021, the graduating class for this year, who have been very active also in the planning and programs. So, without further ado, welcome home, Ramons. Good evening, everyone. After so many years of handling the Alumni Association's convention, this one, I think, is dearest to my heart because we are this year's Silver Jubilarians. Wow, 25 years of being a doctor. And alam ni Dr. Sammy Rastorza kung ilang beses ko na nahandle ang convention ng Alumni Association. This year is even more challenging to prepare this convention because we needed to coordinate many people and high professionals for the platform compared to the pre-COVID time. During those times, we tell the, tell the speakers the topic, the date, and the event's address. And then voila, the event is done. Tapos na sila magsalita. Tapos na event. Mas mahirap talaga ngayon. And I wish we could see each other physically or face-to-face -to, -face to instantly see your reactions during the forum. Now, when it comes to choosing the speakers, as much as possible, we chose alumni who are also co-celebrating with us. 
We also chose them because when we were students or clerks or interns, they were one of the many who made marks in our hearts. So thank you to our dear resource speakers and mentors from the different patches. And to my classmates for continuing the burning desire to celebrate the homecoming in whatever way we can. Thank you to our Alumni Associations Board on their President Dr. Sam Erastorza. And thank you to Dr. Edja Meseda for painstakingly perfecting the webcast series and the members of the scientific committee and the organizational committee. We hope that one day we see each other face to face and we hope that our celebration on October will push through. Enjoy the webisodes. Tatak Ramon. Good evening everyone. I'm Elmer Jose Arevalo Meseda of UERM College of Medicine Class of 96, a Silver Jubilarian and the Scientific Committee and Programs Coordinator for this year's 9th UERM College of Medicine Alumni Association Annual Convention. Every year, the UERM medical community celebrates the Alumni Homecoming event. The activity is spearheaded by the Silver Jubilarians with the active participation of other co-celebrating batches. It is a week-long or sometimes a month-long event of getting together and renewing friendships and catching up with what happened to us after our graduation, which in our minds has not been so long ago. The UERM class of 96 is this year's organizer of the homecoming event. We have prepared for almost three years for this, but the preparations and the plans were derailed by the current world pandemic. Nevertheless, life must go on and we have to adjust and adapt to the demands of the times. To signal the opening of the celebration of the College of Medicine Alumni Homecoming, we will present to you Usapang Buhay Doctor, a webcast series. In order not to aggravate the virtual meeting fatigue already developing in most of us, we envision the webcast series to be light and bubbly, a panel discussion of topics divided into four webisodes starting tonight and every Wednesday evening at 6 until March 10. Tonight you are joining us for webisode number one. For this webisode, you will see topics related to COVID-19. For webisode number 2 on February 24, we will cover topics related to caring for our doctors, caring for ourselves, and caring for our alumni. For webisode number 3 on March 3, we will be discussing medipreneurship. In this webisode, we will highlight our batchmates who have gone into business aside from practicing as a medical doctor. On March 10, for webisode number 4, we will be discussing the medical education and training under the new normal. In this webisode, we will also have the 23rd Dr. Potenciano Bakay Jr. Memorial Lecture. For tonight, our session chairperson is Dr. Lilibet Perez Rabago. She's a fellow of the Philippine Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. She has a Master's of Business Administration in Health and currently the Administrator and Chief Finance Officer at Carmeli Clinic and Hospital in Lawag City. For week two episode, it will be chaired by Dr. Maria Cristina Verceles Baradi. She's a diplomate of the Philippine Board of Ophthalmology. From 2000 to 2008, she has been an ophthalmology consultant at the Healthway Medical Clinics and Fortune Care. From 2008 to 2013, she has been an ophthalmologist at the Rand Memorial Hospital, Freeport, Bahamas. Webisode number three will be chaired by Dr. Ronald S. Perez, 
and I am adult nephrologist. He is the head of the section of nephrology at the Medical City and the Capital Medical Center. For episode number four, it will be chaired by Dr. Jennifer Regina Mejia Mohin. She's a primary care physician at the Mejia Mohin Medical Clinic, and she's a board member and treasurer at the Sure RX Pharmacy Malasiki branch. For those who will miss this webcast, or for those who would want to watch it again, it will be available on the YouTube and Facebook page of the UERM College of Medicine Alumni Association and also on Docwity. So now, I will turn you over to Dr. Lilibet Perez Rabago to start the first session. COVID-19 deserves the crown as the most gripping concern that caught the attention of the world since December of 2019. It claimed and is still claiming millions of lives, devastating world economies, and changed our way of life in more ways than one. Tonight, we will be talking about this pandemic that is upon us. Welcome everyone. I now formally open the first webinar titled, What Happened to COVID-19? The first topic is about managing the long-term effects of COVID-19. This will be discussed by Dr. Mario M. Panaligan. His current positions are the following. Assistant Professor at the College of Medicine of UERM. Medical Specialist too, and Head of the Section of Infectious Diseases, Department of Medicine, Dr. Jose Reyes Memorial Medical Center. Infection Control Coordinator at St. Luke's Medical Center. Member, Data Safety Monitoring Committee, Department of Health. He belongs to numerous professional societies, received honorary recognitions and awards. I cannot name it all, but I will mention a few. He is currently the president of the Philippine College of Physicians, an immediate past president of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Vice President, UERM Memorial College of Medicine Alumni Association. Board of Advisors, Philippine Hospital Infection Control Society. The moderator for this topic is Dr. Maria Cristina H. Ventura, Fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society. My energetic classmate, is currently holding quite a number of positions in different professional societies. She is the president of the Com Community Pediatric Society of the Philippines, the secretary of the Perinatal Association of the Philippines, assistant secretary general of the Philippine Medical Association, and the chair of the pediatric department of Marikina Valley Medical Center. Martini is also an Associate Professor at the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. Good afternoon, classmates and the whole UERM. Um, thank you, Beth, for that introduction. We're so excited because our speaker was very uh, instrumental and a significant person in our clerkship days. Right, classmates? Our next speaker was actually the chief resident of the internal medicine department during that time in 1996. And um, you know that he's now the president of the Philippine College of Physicians. Wow, that's, that's one of the eight specialty divisions in the Philippine Medical Association. So without further ado, may I in, uh, call in to talk about managing the long-term effects of COVID-19. Let's all welcome Dr. Mario Panaligan. Hi, Mario. How are you this afternoon? Hi, Martini. I'm good. And salamat. No? At congratulations sa uh, UERM Class 96. Uh, actually, ito nga yung pinakamasayang batch na kasama ko. In fact, I started first when I was still a first-year resident then. Kaya kasakasama ko sila noon. Uh, pag nag rounds no? nakilala nila kung gano'n ka, sabi nila, kasipag daw, kagaling din daw, 
Oh, I definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, syempre, hindi ko makalimutan eh, ito yung bat na kasama ko sa sa EK, no, nung time na yun. But anyway, uh, when 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 Tina, your classmate actually called me up to, to ask if I can be a speaker, sabi sabi ko, uh, paano naman ako tatanggi, no? And then she yeah. mentioned about the topic. Eh, <laughs> Hindi ito madali, no? Kasi certainly, we are seeing lots of problems, no? With COVID-19. Kahit na one year na tayo nasa pandemic, maraming mga nangyayari. Maraming pang posibleng mangyari. Right now, we're waiting for the vaccines, eh? And I'm sure you'll be asking me later about the vaccine. Or they'll not be covering it because uh, Dr. Rosario will be discussing it, no? In another session. And if you look at This particular slide, you can see on the right side, uh, overlapping colors, no, and that's similar to COVID-19. No? The manifestations are quite varied, overlapping, no, organ system dysfunction, so possibly maging complicated, no, kaya nagkakagulo, maraming namamatay pag nagkaroon ng severe to critical disease. No? But unfortunately, one one thing one thing that's bothering us is the fact that this infection or this disease can cause long-term complications or long-term effects that cannot be predicted. No? So marami rin na mga pasyenteng meron pa rin nararandaman despite no, recovering. Kahit sabihin na natin na wala na yung uh, sakit nila, kahit ang negative na yung PCR as they are tested as required by their offices, meron pa rin silang nararandaman. And I think that's Uh, the important thing that I'll be discussing you know, for today. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so as a disclosure, I'll just have to mention that I have other undertakings aside from being a faculty of our alma mater. Alam ba nito nga kanina? Meron na ako mga pinagkakabalang mga medical organizations. But of course, I also work with some pharmaceutical companies. So all of us know that coronavirus disease 2019 certainly is a major cause of this dreaded disease uh, worldwide. It's a cause by a new respiratory beta coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, first identified in Wuhan, in Hubei province in China. It's under the same family as the SARS-CoV, ito yung SARS dati, saka yung MERS-CoV-2, no? na naging Uh, dahilan din para magkaroon ng epidemic no? uh, that attack or that caused a big problem in Korea then and somehow we actually got feared and we had to uh, protect ourselves during that time. No? And certainly this coronavirus disease has been declared a pandemic last year by the WHO. So based on this data, as you will see, this is uh, dated February 10, uh, 2021. You can see that it's almost 110 million cases worldwide. At marami na namatay, there's almost 2.5 million deaths worldwide. And in the Philippines, you can see that the cases, the number is almost 550,000. So by the time that you hear this, uh, malamang nasa more than 550,000 tayo. And you can see in this uh, graph, that there was actually a decreasing trend a few months ago, but since January, it starts to go up again. So we're now seeing the second wave. In fact, this is quite true in Cebu, and that has been declared already in that area. Uh, kung papansin niyo rin, the case fatality rate has also increased to more than 2%, although you can see that majority are mild And asymptomatic, that's 94.3%. Uh, most of those who get hospitalized are, of course, uh, the elderly, those with comorbid illnesses, and a higher risk of dying. And, and as I've said, no, uh, pag hindi na control ito, like for example, naisip na natin yung mga schools, at saka yung bakuna, huwag naman tayo maging masyadong dependent sa bakuna, kasi baka Mag, magpabaya tayo, makalimutan natin yung ginagawa natin, yung aming advocacy na apat dapat, dapat sa lagi natin inaalala yun so that we'll be able to protect ourselves and also help in controlling the spread of this virus to others. 
So for this particular talk, I'll be discussing briefly the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 disease, the long-term effects, which, can be, which we can term as a post-COVID syndrome, and the management of long COVID. So these are the primary symptoms of COVID-19. The symptoms may appear 2 to 14 days after exposure to the virus. And certainly, some patients would present with congestion or runny nose, anosmia or angustia, or the loss, of, the loss of the sense of smell, as well as a loss of the sense of taste, headache, of dyke cough, sore throat, shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing will be presented later on in the latter part of the week. And of course, some patients would present with fatigue, muscle or body aches, fever or chills, as well as nausea or vomiting, and even diarrhea. And you can see that here in this slide that COVID-19 clinical presentation may vary by age and sex. So in this observational study of Europeans with mild to moderate COVID-19, um, in March to April 2020, where in the mean duration of symptoms is around 11 to 6 days, 11, 6, plus or minus 6 days, ear, nose, throat complaints were more common in young individuals while fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, diarrhea are seen more frequently in the elderly. Now, anosmia, headache, nasal obstruction, throat pain, fatigue are more common in women while cough and fever are more frequent in men. Now, among those who died you know, because of COVID-19 in China, the median time from first system to death is around 14 days. But you will see here that for elderly individuals, it's a lot earlier. There's 11.5 days for individuals at least 70 years old versus those you know, who are less than 70 years old, and that's around 20 days. And in this particular table, uh, yung anosmia, that's around 70%. So that's quite common. Now, kung narinig din na yung uh, uh, UK variant, they said that anosmia and angustia are less common. Mas common doon yung fatigue as well as sore throat and myalgia. Now, fever in this particular study actually was only reported in less than 50% of cases. Now, extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19 are also very common. Which of this can actually return or last? It's unfortunate that we cannot really predict which, which one would come first and which will actually become more prominent much later on, even, even beyond three weeks or three months or even beyond six months. You know? So dermatologic manifestations can also be, can actually become common, particularly vesicles or even erythematous rash and urticaria. Now, headaches, dizziness are quite common early onset. However, these individuals with COVID-19 disease can manifest later on with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, AMI, stroke, and even thromboembolism can happen after the first week, primarily because of the hypercoagulable state of these individuals is severe to critical COVID-19. And that's primarily the reason why um, uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin is being given even for therapeutic purposes. Now, some patients will develop hyperglycemia. In fact, those without diabetes can develop ketoacidosis. Now, at the onset, some patients will develop diarrhea, but of course, these patients can also have abdominal pain uh, associated with liver enlargement or uh, liver abnormalities. Now, for the kidneys, certainly this can be affected even during the early phase or even beyond one week, primarily because of acute in injury, which will later on lead to chronic or to acute dialytic therapy. So looking at the long-term sequelae of COVID-19, there's of course limited peer-reviewed data looking at the occurrence or prevalence of COVID-19-related long-term sequelae. Now it's quite reasonable to anticipate manifestations based on established knowledge of SARS-CoV-2 pathophysiology and other coronavirus infection outcomes. Now for pulmonary, cardiovascular, neurologic, there could be, of course, some disorders or perturbations. And SARS-CoV-2 entry receptor ACE2 express across extrapulmonary tissues. And then among ACE2, hindi lang niya sa lungs. It can also be in the heart, in the liver, in the kidneys, even in the GI tract, and even in the brain. 
na among patients recovering from severe SARS-CoV-2 and or MERS-CoV infection, impaired diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide and exercise capacity common during first six months following discharge. And therefore, after six months, they may actually develop post-traumatic disorder, even depression, anxiety disorders. And that's it's what actually is common among those who develop long-term problems related to COVID-19, which I'll be discussing a little later. Now, for the pulmonary sequelae, you can see in the figure on the right, there are lots of problems, particularly hemorrhage in the lungs. And this is brought about by uh, alveolar damage. And, and you can see that in uh, uh, autopsy cases, there are lots of plated fibrin thrombi, which is indicative of coagulopathy, uh, primarily observed in small arterial vessels of these patients who died because of COVID-19. Now, in a retrospective cohort of patients with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection discharged for five New York City hospitals, 3.6% uh, sought emergency care after a median of 4.5 days. Now, 2% required inpatient readmission. One half of these patients returning for care experienced respiratory distress. And compared with patients not returning for care, those uh, who went to the hospital again had more COPD and hypertension, and there's found a shorter median length of initial stay. Now, looking at the cardiovascular sequelae, um, in an observational course study, uh, CV, CV magnetic resonance performed at the median 71 days from diagnosis, there were abnormal findings seen in more than 75% of patients. And certainly there was a myocardial inflammation in around 60%, and this is independent of pre-existing comorbidities, severity of acute SARS-CoV-2, and the time from diagnosis. And there was also an observation of reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, increased left ventricular volumes. And of course, uh, uh, up to now, we don't know as to how long this would last, primarily because in all observational studies, there are still lots of patients who still develop cardiomyopathy as well as cardiac arrhythmias. So you can see here in this figure, how actually the heart can be affected primarily because of COVID-19 infection. So in the viral infection, certainly the lungs are primarily infected, and this can lead to a systemic inflammation primarily because of the release of the cytokines. And certainly this can later on produce some problems in the heart. And along with, of course, the uh, pharmacologic therapy, this can also contribute to the presence of arrhythmia. However, because of systemic inflammation, Certainly, myocarditis and acute cardiac injury can occur, aside, of course, from the hypercoagulable state. And certainly, these individuals are prone to develop acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction. Now, uh, remember also that those individuals who are elderly and those with underlying comorbids are also at a higher risk of developing uh, cardiovascular events. And this is, of course, induced primarily because of the COVID-19 disease. Now for the neurologic sequelae, alam natin na may anosmia at angusia, and certainly in the full prevalence of a systematic review or the prevalence reported in the systematic review and meta-analysis including 24 studies confirmed COVID-19, that's with an end of more than 8,000 individuals, anosmia was reported in 41%, Agusha in 38.2%. And we have to remember what I said in one study earlier that the, this, the incidence of these two conditions or these symptoms are decreased among older individuals. Now, it's not yet clear whether these problems can actually persist or can be just transient because we still don't know how long this will last. I have seen one patient with anosmia lasting for more than three months. It's quite really difficult how he can actually deal with it um, because of his family as well as his wife. Now, respiratory virus infections are associated with neurological and psychiatric sequelae, including Parkinsonism, dementia, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. And certainly, this is one big area 
which we are too concerned about primarily because of uh, the depression that most of these patients would have because of the persisting uh, conditions related to COVID-19. And in our follow-up of this patient to develop this uh, neurologic uh, disorders or uh, sequelae, we really have also to assess the cognitive function of these individuals, particularly the uh, individuals who are elderly. Aside, of course, from thinking that they may actually be suffering from dementia. Now, moving to post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, otherwise known as long COVID or post-COVID syndrome, post-acute COVID-19, or even long haulers. Now, we have to remember that these individuals con can continue to experience the same manifestations of the acute phase of infection. So, possibly, magkaroon sila rin ng chronic cough, myalgia, fatigue, headache, uh, and uh, they have come out with some conditions that are defined based on the duration of the symptomatology. So for acute COVID-19, usually the manifestations will last up to four weeks. For ongoing symptomatic COVID-19, same manifestations or the usual manifestations lasting up to uh, four to 12 weeks. And post-COVID-19 syndrome uh, or chronic syndrome lasting for 12 weeks or longer. Now, long covid it's a combination of ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 syndrome. Now, for this particular condition, the exact mechanism is unknown. It can be a combination, uh, primarily because of persistent bacteremia due to weak or absent antibody response, uh, relapse or reinfection. Remember that reinfection can actually occur. And there are already reports or isolated reports of reinfection, not only because of the variants, but even because of the, pos of the uh, possibility that our antibody levels can go down you know, beyond three to five months. Inflammatory and other immune reactions, deconditioning, and mental factors such as post-traumatic stress, and this can all contribute. Now, looking at this particular study, the experience from Italy, uh, post-acute outpatient service for patients who recovered from COVID-19. So, naka-recover na. The mean hospital days around 3.5 days. And each individual assessed by standard questionnaire at the mean of 60.3 days after onset of first COVID-19-related symptom, 32% had one to two persistent symptoms. Now, more than 50% had at least three persistent symptoms. Now, looking at, of course, the symptomatology in the right figure, none actually presented with fever or signs of acute illness. The majority actually presented with fatigue, dyspnea, and, of course, um, joint pain. Now, it's also uh, worth notable, or it was actually notable to, uh, to see that 44% of these patients supported a lower quality of life. Now, looking at post-COVID, six months after in Wuhan, China, you can see that they were able to follow up a cohort of more than 1,700 adult patients. 52% are men with an age of 57 years old. Now, 76% reported at least one symptom that persisted. So I mean, that's more than three-fourths. Now, with fatigue, same as earlier, or muscle weakness being the most frequently reported symptom. That's around 63%. Now, 26% were, were, did, um, had uh, difficulty sleeping. Now, more than 50% were with residual chest imaging abnormalities. Now, the disease severity during the acute phase was independently associated with the extent of lung diffusion impairment at follow-up with an ADS ratio of 4.6%. Now, in this particular group, 56% no, uh, of these patients requiring high-flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation, and invasive mechanical ventilation during the hospital stay. So you can see the more severe the, the previous COVID-19 disease, the higher, of course, the likelihood that there will be a persistent lung diffusion abnormality. So uh, if we see patients who develop severe to critical COVID, no, uh, we really have to monitor them very well, primarily because they may still have persistent 
dyspnea and may even require oxygen supplementation for a longer period. Similar to what we saw in an, uh, one patient, the seafarer who got admitted in uh, St. of Global before. Now, looking at the post-discharge uh, symptoms and rehabilitation needs in United Kingdom, so they were able to uh, interview 100 post-COVID patients. Uh, among these 100, there were 32 who got admitted to the ICU, majority with underlying comorbids, and 58 were overweight to obese. So telephone interviews conducted to know the symptoms while the rehabilitation needs were assessed uh, by a questionnaire, the AQ5D5L with five domains that include mobility, personal care, usual activities, pain, and anxiety, depression. And among these 100 individuals, most people reported problems are similar to the previous studies, which were active fatigue. Added to that is the breathlessness. Now, it was, of course, a clinically significant drop in the EQ5D or the quality of life in 68.8% no, on the IC group and almost 50% in the ward group. So you can see that even those in admitted in the ward patients can have diminished quality of life and therefore really have to monitor them, particularly in terms of the manifestations that can persist even post discharge. Now looking at the uh, return to the use of health, so you can see that the uh, the older they are, there's a higher risk, of course, of delay in the return to the usual health, as well as in number of medical conditions. The higher the number, of course, the longer the delay in the return to the usual health. And of course, individual risk factors like hypertension, obesity, psychiatric condition, immunosuppressive condition are higher risk, of course, of delay return to usual health. Now, for the 60-day outcomes of hospitalized patients in the U.S., Looking at a cohort of 1,250 patients, 189 rehospitalized. However, 84 of these individuals died. So they were able to interview for 488. And out of this, 32% reported cough and dyspnea, and 92 of them had new or worsening cough and dyspnea. 195 with previous employment, only 60% returned to work and around 26% reported reduced hours or modified duties due to health reasons. Now, nearly half of patients reportedly being emotionally affected by their health, and in fact, 28 seeking care for mental health. And this is quite important. So 37%, that's almost 40% reporting mild financial impact from their hospitalization. In fact, 47 reported that most of all or all of their savings got consumed. You know? And therefore, you can see the impact, of course, of uh, the severity as well as hospitalization related to COVID-19. So how do you approach you know, uh, long COVID individuals, those patients with long COVID? First, of course, we need to know the likelihood of developing the long-term effects of COVID-19 among these patients, particularly those with um, critical or severe COVID-19 disease before, and primarily because uh, they may in fact have you know, a higher risk, but we also need to remember that even those with milder cases can also have long COVID syndrome or post COVID you know, um, disease syndrome. Now the most common symptoms are still fatigue and breathlessness. Now symptoms may be singular, multiple constant, transient, fluctuating, but can change you know, in nature over time. And of course, we need to, of course, uh, identify people with ongoing symptomatic COVID-19, primarily because they have to make, we have to make sure that we uh, rule out the possibility of reinfection or again, persistent infection that can progress to severe to critical condition. So this is a checklist uh, that we can use again. Don't forget fatigue and breathlessness, but do not forget the other organ systems that can actually become abnormal. So respiratory, cardiovascular, and even uh, neurologic, GI, musculoskeletal, ear, nose, and throat, skin, of course, we need to inspect it. This can actually be the first time that dermatologic manifestations due to COVID can occur. Now, how do we manage it? Of course, primarily supportive. No? Importante, importante, 
na masigurado natin na hindi sila recurrent or reinfection with COVID. No? So we need to check, do some diagnostic workup, uh, repeat the biomarkers, and of course, the extra test to rule out other possible causes. Because we need to uh, check whether there is an underlying comorbid that has become active or there could be a new onset diabetes because there are reports of new onset diabetes after COVID-19. And certainly, we need, to manage, we need to manage them properly. Of course, it is recommended to repeat the chest imaging because the persistence of a lung problems is always there primarily because of this uh, long COVID syndrome. Now, it's also important to make sure that we keep track of all these patients and also we maintain a network a referral system um, so that we can refer this patient to specific subspecialties when necessary. In fact, respiratory care should be continued primarily because uh, there could be some persistence in the lung problem or in the lung abnormality, aside from, of course, uh, the physical rehabilitation. Certainly, we need to provide some social financial cultural support primarily because we need to make sure that they are uh, prepared psychologically so that they will be able to handle themselves uh, appropriately. Dapat alam din nila ang panel magawa ng paraan agad. Yung hindi agad magpapabaya, kailangan din malaman nila kung paano sila kukunsulta agad. So dapat yung network systems maging maayos din para sa kanila. So just have to remember, when we talk of the long COVID guidelines, this need to reflect lived experiences. And as I said earlier, this long hauler certainly has made us uh, more confused in terms of how they would manifest, particularly those with long COVID syndrome, primarily because this again can progress and therefore we must make sure that we will be able to monitor them properly. So this is one narrative given by Paul Garner. Actually, he is a professor of infectious disease. And you can see during his time, during the first time that he got the disease, he felt a roller coaster of ill health with extreme emotions and other exhaustion. And of course, a few months later, he still had this feeling and he kept on thinking about uh, the, the possibility of reinfection because he would still have feeling of uh, myalgia, fatigue, and therefore we still, very, we, feel, we still feel very sick. He was actually un, having this chronic fatigue syndrome at that time. He still had problems breathing, and therefore he kept on wondering when this would end. And of course, a few months later, that's around four to five months later, um, he still actually was still feeling um, very, very bad. Um, and he kept on thinking what will happen next because he could still, uh, he could not imagine himself really getting well uh, because of the possibility of getting sick again. And that's primarily the reason why we need to provide them proper counseling and, of course, psychological support. And you can see the impact of COVID 19 in terms of the mental health as well as the stigma associated with it. So, so because of the persistence and clinical sequelae, certainly there is an effect on the emotional and behavioral uh, patterns of all our patients. And of course, we must not forget the lingering illnesses that these individuals can have, like the myofascial pain syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, as I've said, and even the post-traumatic stress disorder, primarily because of the uh, persistent uh, feeling of easy fatigability and even the myalgia. And of course, the related stigma associated with a COVID-19 diagnosis. Remember that pagka na-diagnose na o pag pinag-suspect siyaan, kailangan na kaisulit hanggang sila. So you can just imagine the, the feeling that these patients would have, no? particularly when they are required no? to get isolated and of course uh, observe the physical distancing that is quite important to prevent the spread. Imagine, of course, the feeling of loneliness that these patients would have. Again, of course, if they had developed it before, and again, if they will again practice it, you can see the difficulty and how they're gonna cope with it. So the sense of hopelessness will always be there related to the stigma, and therefore we must be able to be, uh, we must be uh, supportive to all these individuals who got uh, COVID-19 disease. So how do we now uh, advice or how do you handle these individuals who would like really to go back to physical activity and even to 
to go back to their work. Remember the issues, the prolonged recovery among those individuals with post-COVID syndrome, as well as, of course, a mindset that there could be potential complications, including the enduring illness. Well, so what we need to resolve is that the first question is, what are the risks of physical activity after COVID-19? So pag COVID na sila dati, kailangan tanongin natin kung na-hospital ba sila. Kasi pag na-hospital, siyempre, it's either moderate or severe to critical. So, siyempre, pagka severe to critical, higher on the uh, post-COVID syndrome at higher din yung possibility na meron silang um, post-COVID syndrome at possibly pang mag-persistent even beyond five to six months. No? But definitely, I need to reiterate what I said earlier that the severity is not after directly related to the development of post-COVID syndrome. So, even mild disease before, you can also have uh, post-COVID syndrome. Second question is how do I know if my patient can safely return to physical activity? So you need to consider three illness baseline uh, and you need to tailor, of course, the guidance accordingly. So kung dati, athletic siya, then siyempre, gusto mo, mabalik sana siya, pero dapat dahan-dahan. And of course, you need to psych him up and uh, make him ready because the recovery should be gradual, hindi pwede madaliin kasi posible talagang lumala pag biglinigla. Uh, kasi lalo-lalo na kung nagkaroon pa siya ng mga complications related to the heart and of course to the lungs. And the last, of course, how do I guide the patient back to physical activity? As I've said, no, we must be prudent. We must not uh, 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 we must not hurry in, hurry up. I mean, he must not hurry up. Kailangan lagi natin siya i-guide. Kailangan, kailangan natin sasabihan lagi na dapat dahan-dahan kasi hindi pwedeng mabigla Kasi pwedeng talagang uh, magkaroon ulit ng problem, particularly uh, those events, no? cardiovascular events related to hypercoagulability and of course the complications related to uh, chronic lung uh, disorder. So when we talk about this algorithm, um, so if the patient seeks guidance on returning to physical activity following COVID-19 infection, certainly we need to ask whether this patient got hospitalized Certainly, if the answer is yes, then we need to refer him, of course, to rehabilitation and check, of course, for some problems related to the heart, related to the lungs, and even to the other organs. Uh, if the answer is no, then ask if the patient develops some heart symptoms, particularly chest pain palpitations. If the answer is yes, again, refer to cardiology and investigate, particularly the presence of myocarditis. Don't forget, uh, Acute cardiac injury could have happened and that can actually be persistent because these patients can actually develop cardiomyopathy and therefore there'll be uh, persistence of diminished physical activity. Now, if the answer is no, then again, and then check for adverse psychological symptoms such as a post-traumatic stress disorder. For meron, then of course you need to refer this patient for some psychiatric or psychological help. If the answer is no, Check for other enduring symptoms post-COVID, like respiratory, gas intestinal, rheumatological, or even the other uh, organs. If the, of course, if the answer is sagot, eh, kung ang sagot, eh, yes, certainly you need to refer him to a specific subspecialty as necessary. But of course, if the answer is no, and the patient is symptomatic for at least seven days, then you can advise this patient uh, to return to physical activity. Pero, Dapat dahan-dahan pa rin. Dapat may phases yan. So, hindi dapat mamadaliin. Dapat babantayan. Kung sa umpisa, madali pa rin na pagod, then babalik sa umpisa ulit. Balik sa, sa basic. So, dapat uh, maglalakad muna. Hindi pwede dapat biglain. So, kung nakapasa na sa phase 1, then gradually, you now increase, of course, the activity that this patient could have on a weekly basis. For, for as long as a patient will don't get tired immediately, then he can continue going back to his usual activity. And he, of course, he, he is able to go back to his uh, pre-illness baseline activity. So for the important points that we need to remember, the definition of post-acute COVID-19 is still unclear as manifestations and duration of symptoms remain variable. Now, common symptoms include fatigue and dyspnea or breathlessness. However, specific organ dysfunction has been reported. 
Now, indications for specialist assessments include clinical concerns along with respiratory cardiac or neurologic symptoms that are new, persistent, or progressive. Now, you need to uh, stratify the risk of your patients before recommending a return to physical activity or even to work among people who have had COVID-19. So let me end with this particular statement from our daily bread today, coming from Psalm chapter 37, verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Thank you for listening. And of course, I'd like to show this picture in memory of, uh, of course, your batchmates here. There are four, I think. <laughs> and wala nyo na kung sino kinakamukhang bata. But of course, nakikisama ako sa mga bata kaysa sa akin ng time na yan. But you can see here your batchmates, Tina, Vince, Nico, and of course, the soon to become the Board of Regents of PCP, I hope, the Radio. So, again, thank you very much and congratulations to you are in class night six. Thank you, Mario. Wow, that was really very informative, no? And um, comprehensive as well. I have here with me in the studio this afternoon some of my classmates, no? Who were very interested also in um, posing questions regarding our topic for this afternoon. Uh, make first call on Dr. Shira uh, Recto Malabana. Shira, hi. Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone, especially to our very esteemed speaker. Uh, Ang kinakatakutan talaga natin no. <laughs> wala wala yan. Takot-takot na kasira batang ganyan niya yan eh. Oo, uh, kababayan ko yan. Uh, uh, anyway, I usually ano rin talaga uh, message Mario especially during this pandemic which I think kasi kumbaga direct ang lifeline ko. Uh, pagka ano may mga tanong ako. But I have several questions based on your ano. Kasi nakatakot siya. Um <laughs> Shira, hold on na. Ah. I need to uh, review I need to cut lang no kasi I I um I introduced you wrongly. Um, may I call on um, my classmate, Shira Recto Brown? Hi, Shira. Hi. Hi, Martini. Okay. Your question, please, for Mo Dr. Mario. So I have several questions for Mario, for my lifeline, Mario. Okay. Based on your, ano, your lecture. So um, I, I noticed that, uh, of course, your lecture talk, talk, talked about yung mga sequelae, especially for our COVID. Um, positives na talagang nag ano nag serious ano but what about those asymptomatics uh, na previously um, or mildly symptomatic na hindi na admit or what pero they have um comorbids um can they develop also those sequelae that, that you're talking about another question ano yung kanila lampsan ko na so you can answer in your own way <laughs> tina tinatakot na talaga kita ano uh, so, in COVID daw, with other lectures then, they said that it can lurk. So, if you're um, probably asymptomatic or dati symptom, uh, symptomatic ka, nagka-COVID, and then you thought you're um, okay ka na, wala ka na malagiging symptomas, pero, pero it can lurk daw. Uh, may dormancy daw dyan. And yung, yung minention mo na isa, for the long haulers na may ano, uh, long COVID um, um, problems, Will they also have ano, long infectivity? So, yun. Ato lang? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Yun muna. <laughs> Mangungulit ka lang ako ulit. <laughs> De, salamat, uh, Shira. And, I-miss ko na ito eh. Um, Teka lang kasi hindi ako nakaka ay, nakapunta sa kalis sa Batangas. Oo Hindi nga, ako eh. pero bihira akong lumayo. But anyway, uh, doon sa unang tanong, salamat. No? Uh, yung mild asymptomatic, uh, uh, siyempre, sabi ko nga, bihira naman talaga na lumalala. Uh, bihira rin sila makahawa to start with. No? 10% lang ng mga asymptomatic patients yung posibleng makatransmit. So majority still do symptomatic transmission. And siyempre, yung possibility na makaroon sila ng sequelae, mababa din kasi wala silang symptoms to start with. But the only problem is, of course, yung possibility of reinfection because we still don't know. Uh, nimbawa, kung later on, my exposure is a variant and therefore which they still don't know. You see, they still don't have the antibody against the variant. It's fortunate that I think we are able to control it. Nasa buntok, hindi ko na alam kung nadagdagan pa. But 
We don't know kung magkakaroon ulit ng variant. Kasi remember, magkaroon tayo dati ng D, D, D614G uh, last year. And therefore, magkakaroon pa rin tayo ng mga variants eh, na hindi natin lang gano'ng kalala at gano'ng ka-transmissible yun. No? Similar to the South Korean, the Brazilian, and the UK variant. No? Um, so, malabo. Yung sinasabi mo na posible sila magka-sequelae, magka-mild o asymptomatic kasi wala talaga sila yung symptoms. Eh. But the trouble lang yung reinfection is we don't know it can happen because yung mga reinfection na report uh, dati, yung seven and kasama sa lectures ko, um, hindi sila because of the variant but because of the a different, a different uh, like mutation lang. But it's not really a variant but it's different from the original strain kaya nagkaroon rin yung reinfection. So, posible yun. Um, now, the second question, uh, COVID symptomatic, uh, dormancy. Um, actually, hindi naman sila nagiging dormant. Um, but, of course, yung possibility lang na nag-persist yung post-COVID syndrome na, uh, primarily because yung nabanggit kong possible reasons, possibly because of the persistent virinia, Um, which is not common, by the way, or because of our immune reaction. Remember, in the pathophysiological COVID-19 disease, hyperintense inflammation din siya aside from hypercoagulability, and therefore, uh, the behavior is not going to be the same as the usual viral infection, and therefore, there could be some chronic you know, inflammation that can happen. And that's the reason why we have this... Uh, uh, chronic manifestations like the myofascial pain syndrome, I really had a problem handling one patient na si Fayre, na talagang sobrang sakit lagi ng binti. Hindi nga siya makalakad. In fact, he had to stay for five months in the hospital kasi hirap na hirap talagang maglakad until makauwi. You know? And he was actually requiring oxygen therapy. But this is, of course, a person who developed critical COVID no, abroad. No? So, hindi naman sila nagiging dormant, kaya lang nagkakaroon ng post-COVID syndrome, which again be related to the uh, hyperinflammation related to COVID-19 disease. Yung sa long haulers, ano nga tanong mo, Sira? Long haulers? So, long haulers, are, do they have long infectivity period? Ah, ah, ah. Yung long in infectivity, actually, hindi natin alam, pero in majority of cases, kahit yung mga post-COVID syndrome na, um, He say that the infectivity, for example, if the symptoms are milder than the first week or two weeks, uh, usually infectious sila nawawala na rin after two weeks. In fact, majority, the infectivity would be only after until 10 days. That's majority. No? Uh, if, for example, the symptoms have become milder than the usual. So in definition naman ng improvement, It doesn't really mean na nawala o na disappear in symptoms. But if there is a mark or an improvement in the manifestations, then that can also be classified as recovered. And therefore, the infectivity also is diminished or disappeared. So usually, after 10 days or more, immunity infectious. And that's primarily the reason, as much as possible, hindi na dapat tinuulit yung PCR. Kasi ang problem sa PCR, I'm sure alam nyo naman na, pag yung PCR tinest mo li, the likelihood of, making, of, of having a positive result is high. Even if, for example, the virus is already dead, kasi yung fragment lang, kasi PCR siya, madidetect siya. So, malilabel ka na positive. And I had one patient na the other time na uh, uh, more than two months na, nag, nag actually more than three months na, positive pa rin ka yung PCR. Kaya humingi siya sa akin ng clearance. Sabi ko, hindi na, hindi ka na talaga infected kasi wala ka ng symptoms. Kaya may positive pa rin siya kasi hindi required for executive check. So, yung infectivity actually is less likely beyond two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, we have other questions from our classmates. Um, may we hear from Dr. Anafe, Gloria. Hi, hi Anafe. Hi, Anafe. Please go ahead with your question. Tuwa ako sa kanya kanina. Ay, sorry. Hindi pa lang araw yun. <laughs> Uh, you have to unmute, Anafe. Okay. Um, Doc, um, meron kasing mga early studies. Actually, sa radyo ko nga napakinggan yun. 
Pero one time I was driving na um, COVID can affect the spar- uh, spermatogenesis of men. So, have we observed that here or we still don't have studies about that here in our country? Actually, wala pa naman. Um, wala pa. Uh, I think, wala pa akong nabalitaan. I mean, wala pa rin akong nabasa. Um, so, kung may nagbalita, I don't know kung troll yun. <laughs> Really, you, you can you can actually read it in ano, like in Medscape, no? They are posting uh, early studies now. Na nasa sa spermatogenesis. Yeah. Maybe not yet uh, documented or proven. Uh, kaya wala pa talaga na report. So yes, we so don't know. Oh, uh, maybe maybe. Kasi remember that this virus still evolving. Kaya nakakatakot pa rin naman siya. Kaya kanina ba nabanggit ko eh, sabi ko in-anticipate ko na may magkatanong sa inyo tungkol sa vaccines. Eh. Kasi kahit na may vaccine na, whatever vaccine that will be given to you, you still need to continue adherence eh, to the minimum uh, health standards. Kasi hindi naman guarantee yun that we can actually uh, can avoid getting sick with the vaccine on you. So, kasi evolving siya eh. Um, Posible kasi may variant later on na bilitaw na baka yun na may effect na doon talaga sa spermatogenesis. And we don't know. So, baka naman later on. I, so, I, I read it in Medscape. Mm-hmm. May nagtatanong po na class. Mm-hmm. Pero wala pa, wala, pa ko na, wala pa akong na, nabasa na actual study or article that look into it. No? So, wala pa. Sige, Doc. I'll, 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 I'll look at it. Don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. But I'll thank look at it, and certainly it's important. Eh? For me, because this is a valid concern. Uh, kasi dati si Zika, naalala mo si Zika, concerns sa pregnant women. And even sa men kasi, di ba, natatransmit to, to the sperm in Zika. And that, definitely that can happen. Okay, next question. May call on Dr. Len Len. Hi, Sir Len Mario. Len. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hello. Hi, Len. Hi, Len. Sir. Yeah. How are you? Bago, ah. oh. <laughs> Sir, may question ako about our pregnant women. Kasi kawawang-kawawa sila dahil after 14 days, pag hindi pa sila nanganganak, they had to repeat the RT-PCR. And then I had this pregnant patient na positive talaga siya. And after two weeks of quarantine, so 21 days na from the quarantine, positive pa rin siya. Asymptomatic na siya. So she had to go and have labor in the COVID uh, room and delivered in the COVID um, operating room. It's so expensive for the patients. When do you expect that to be negative? Honestly, we don't know. Um, kasi nga, yung PCR kasi is very sensitive in picking up even the dead virus. Um, but the unfortunate, un- unfortunate problem lang lagi sa mga uh, pupunta sa operating room or sa delivery room, naging hospital policy kasi siya eh. So, it's not easy to correct it at this time. Um, kasi yung fear of all people in that room, uh, baka kasi mahawa sila. Kaya as much as possible talaga, nire-require pa din. But, so, even if asymptomatic na po? Even if asymptomatic, eh, nire-require. Although, as I've said, kung nga sabi ko kasi, uh, beyond 10 days, usually, pagka from the time nag-positive ka, unlikely na maging infectious ka pa eh. But the problem is the hospital policy. And that's a common problem in different hospitals. Eh. Kasi nila require siya. Kasi ang problema, hindi natin mabago ngayon. Uh, because again, of the risk of other people getting sick. Siyempre, takot pa rin sila. Uh, kahit sinasabi na yung paulit-ulit na binago na eh. Guidelines even from the peace meeting. Na beyond 10 days talaga, hindi naman na siya infectious. Infectious. So now, hindi pa rin nababago yung mga hospital policies. So now, because of the, the fear as well as the uh, thinking that there is still this risk of getting uh, the, the, the virus from that particular individual. So sir, as of now, wala pa tayong timetable. Because after two days, she tested. She was tested again. Um, the baby was negative and she was tested again. Negative na po. Before, before going home. At least, Two ano, days lang. 
ang comfort ang alam diyan, ang consolation lang diyan. At least kung naka-quarantine siya before she gave birth, tapos uh, at least complete siya in 10 days at least, no, na wala siyang symptoms. Sa likelihood na nakakawa siya, mababang mababaw halos wala na. So, at least a consolation, she can still take care of her baby. Uh, na kahit case pa niya, kasi wala na. Wala na sa kanya. Hindi na niya makakawa niya sa baby niya. Okay. Yes, Thanks, Len. Thank Len. you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Thank you. Dr. Mar, I have a question. Um, I'm sure a lot of our classmates and other alumni are would want to come home to Manila for a homecoming. Um, with the travel restrictions or that's starting to ease up, what could we share with our viewers this afternoon? Uh, honestly, kasi yung requirement pa rin, even if you get vaccinated abroad, no? Uh, the policy is still the same. You still need to quarantine yourself for the next two weeks. Eh. Um, you need to get isolated pa rin kahit na vaccinate ka na abroad. Hindi pa siya nababago unless of course uh, unless of course you met to Manila kung sakali vaccinate na majority sa atin. Pero malaki yung matagal pa mangyari yun. Eh. So of course we will see kasi nagbabago naman yung mga recommendations yung policy um but up to now, uh, the requirement to get isolated or quarantined in the next two weeks after arrival, nandun pa rin siya, kahit na nabakunahan sila. Alam ko, marami kayong kaklase. Uh, actually, mga kaklase ko rin, nabakunahan na abroad. Eh. So, yeah. and, and they really, of course, would want to come here. So sabi, sabi, sabi ko nga, uh, auntie ko nga, eh, gusto gusto na pumunta rito kasi nabakunahan siya last month pa eh. Um, kaya sabi ko, sige mo, wala, hindi ko kayo pagda-drive kasi hindi ko yung allowed may pag-drive kayo kasi hihiro na yung sakyan ko eh. Sabi ko, ay, hindi, 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 hindi ko kayo papayahan, hindi ko kayo magsasamahan kasi kayo magda-drive din dito sa Pilipinas kasi ba, mauhuli ako kasi, kasi, ba, mauhuli. Kahit joke yun, pwede na may tago, pero huwag niyong gagawin yun. Basta, <laughs> but, but definitely, it's still the policy of the government. Okay. On that note, I guess we have to end this session for this afternoon. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Mario Panaligan. And thank you to my classmates who are also here to join us for this session. Um, and uh, this is why we're doing this virtually, because we can't be together physically yet. Right? So thank you very much. And um, please do watch our next episode coming up soon. Thank you. Salamat. Thank you, Salamat. Mario. Thanks, Mario. Salamat. Salamat. Thank you, Dr. Mario, Dr. Martini, and all those who participated in this very interesting discourse. We will now proceed to the second topic, COVID-19 vaccine update, comparison, complications, and timing. This topic will be discussed by Dr. Minette Claire Rosario. Dr. Minette is an associate professor at the College of Medicine and an active consultant at UERM. She is the Infection Control Committee Head of our Alma Mater from 2015 to present. She is also an active consultant at St. Luke's Medical Center, where she is the Program Coordinator for Infectious Disease Continuing Medical Education from 2008 to 2021. She is also the head of the vaccine implementation and deployment of the same institution. She is also an active consultant at the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, where she is a member of the transplant team and infection control committee. Dr. Minette is a member of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. She is currently the chair on the committee on adult immunization of the society. A highly qualified speaker for our vaccine concerns, don't you think? We have two moderators for this topic, Dr. Tina and Dr. Alice. Dr. Martina Alcantara finished her residency training in internal medicine at UERM, where she is now an active consultant and an associate professor at the College of Medicine. She finished her fellowship in nephrology at the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, where she is an active 
non-rotating consultant. She is also an active consultant at St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City. Dr. Tina is currently a member of the Residency Training Committee of both UERM and St. Luke's Global City. Dr. Alice Arcano is a fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society. She finished her training in pediatrics at Dr. Fedel Mundo Medical Center, where she is currently affiliated. Her other hospital affiliations are Diliman Doctors Hospital and Commonwealth Hospital and Medical Center. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Beth, for that kind introduction to the three of us. So we are here tonight to discuss vaccine updates. And we have here Dr. Minette Tosario and my batchmate, Dr. Alice Arcano. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Minette no, for accepting our invitation to be the main discussant no, in this webinar. So incidentally, Dr. Minette is also a celebrant having graduated with her batch UER in Medicine 2001. So that's 20 years from graduation. So Minette, this is an opportune time for you and your batchmates to start the ball rolling in preparation for your 25th. I remember we started our uh, discussing uh, our 25th after we listened and attended the 25th uh, anniversary celebration of batch 1991. Oh, happened to be my brother. So Siminet is uh, an IDS consultant also in UERM and NKPI. So medyo matagal na kami magkasama. Marami na kami pasyente na hopefully na pagaling. So tonight we will uh, hear her out as we uh, discuss the various questions no, the, about vaccines for COVID. So the hot topic anywhere in the world is COVID-19. And in 2021, the emergence of our vaccines. So the objective really of this webinar is simply lang, no, for us, the participants, to gain a positive and a correct attitude towards vaccination no, against COVID-19. Okay, so Alice, anong masasabi mo? Um, good evening, Dr. Minet and Tina. Ko naman, um, having attended numerous lectures regarding COVID and having listened to all questions being asked by the audience, we came up with the most relevant and uh, repeatedly asked questions. I hope that uh, we will be more enlightened in the next 30 minutes. So, Tina, Dr. Rosario, shall we start? Okay. okay. So, game. Um, first question, game na, no? Oh, the first question is, ano ba itong mga vaccines na to na, na develop? No? How are, in general, de they are developed? So, meron ba siyang sinasabing efficacy at effectivity na kailangan nating malaman no and naririnig natin sa news no uh, both social media and the print there are phases no of trial in this vaccine development maybe you can enlighten us first ano ba itong mga gantong pagdevelop ng bakuna uh, okay um i prepared a slide okay lang pakita yes para mas thank klaro. you oo para mas klaro Yan. Share ko sa inyo. There is a difference sa uh, vaccine efficacy and effectiveness. These are one of the terms na parati nating maririnig, but kailangan siyang i-differentiate. So, if you will see here that efficacy and effectiveness, isang definition lang siya. Reduction in disease or clinical outcomes due to the vaccination. But if you do a Google Translate, efficacy and effectiveness to Filipino, i-Google Translate nyo, isa lang yan, visa. That Kaya gusto natin siya i-differentiate kasi minsan nakakalito if you just use it as visa. So, efficacy is more about ideal setting. Imagine niyo yung sa clinical trials, all healthy population yan eh. All healthy individuals, they want all healthy individuals because mas maganda yung makikita. Parang mas clean ang um, 
outcomes na nakikita instead of the outliers of those na merong ibang sakit. And then mm-hmm. for, uh, it's mostly about, you're also considering, for example, not just the population, isipin nyo din yung vaccine dosing during the trial, most of the individuals included in the trial, they can follow strictly yung schedule. So efficacy, most likely, will always be higher than effectiveness. Eh, yung effectiveness naman, ito yung real-world setting, meaning it's about the implementation. So mm-hmm. during, uh, when we talk about effectiveness, it's more about you have all the other comorbid conditions. Implementation-wise, not everyone will follow the schedule. You're also worried about vaccine storage because that can also affect the effectiveness of the vaccine. So it's a, the ideal setting is efficacy. Effectiveness is the real world setting. So sometimes you, you see that vaccine effectiveness will be lower than efficacy. And then when we say that the vaccine efficacy is 90%, it will, it will state or it means that there is a 90% reduction in disease occurrence in those who were vaccinated. And then I think, Dr. Tina, tama ba? You also asked about um, the phases of the trial. Tama ba? Yes, kasi naririnig natin sa mga balita, di ba, nasa phase 3 na, yung isa nasa phase 2 pa lang. So, yeah. how important is that? Okay. The importance of knowing clinical trials is because we are hearing about emergency use authorization. And then yung nilalabas na trial results are um, by phases. If you have uh, finished a uh, particular phase, kung nari phase 1 and 2, lalabas na yung data dyan. So most of the studies now have a phase 3 information. You will see here in this infographic from FDA that you have very few volunteers in the phase one. And it's mostly about uh, uh, safety, okay? And then when you go to the phase two, they add more individuals in that population. And then they start asking about what are the short, short-term short side effects or what is the response in the immune system if we're talking about vaccines. Ito na yung binabasang term like immunogenicity. And then when you go through the phase three trials, you have more and more individuals. And then phase two will not stop. They will uh, sift through all the data. And then so phase three naman, safety and then efficacy is also evaluated. And what will be the most common side effects? Kasi nga, you have larger population. But the FDA will only grant the license for the use of that drug or vaccine if you if they saw that it is safe and effective and the benefit will outweigh the risk. Okay, Minette, no? So, klaro yun. May nabanggit kang term immunogenicity, no? Pwede ba nating iklaro yun uh, in reference yeah. sa, di ba, ating mga bakuna and its effectivity? Okay. So, this is more about the ability of the vaccine to elicit the measurable immune response. Measurable means after they receive the vaccine, kukuha na yung uh, individual ng blood test and then they will check the levels of the antibodies. But uh, you will see also here explaining what happens when we develop that immune response. The difference between the upper and the lower graph is in the upper graph, you will see that the primary infection, initially, and you haven't had an infection before, you were exposed to the either the virus or bacteria, your cells will now be triggered to be produced. And then you will also see here that when the when your body has been able to respond to that infection, eventually the next exposure will trigger a higher level of antibody response. Okay. It is differentiated from the graph below. You will see here the vaccine. When you administer, you have the same level of T cell and antibody response, but you do not develop the disease. Okay, And then again, another exposure or even uh, first uh, the primary exposure that happens, you will develop the antibodies. And Okay, so yung 
uh, upper graph, yan yung uh, parang nangyayari sa taong nagkaroon talaga ng exposure. Tama? Natural okay. infection. Natural yes. infection. Oo. And then, yung sa B, ito na yung, kumbaga sabi natin, uh, molecular uh, level. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Now, yung reaction niya sa katawan, iba pa yon, no? Those iba are clinical pa. signs. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. We call that reactogenicity. So, there's a yes. subset of reactions, physical manifestations of inflam- inflammatory response to the vaccine. Okay. What happens here is, you introduce the vaccine, the mere puncture, and the content of the vaccine will elicit a local cell stimulation, presenting as um, swelling, pain, redness, or tenderness. Okay? And the chemicals or the factors, like you see there, the vasodilators, prostaglandins, some of those will go into the bloodstream. And when it goes into the bloodstream, and ito na yung systemic adverse events na sinasabi na, na nagmamanifest. You have headache, nilalagnat ang patient, um, meron ding myalgia, fatigue, meron din yung ganyan. Kung minsan may nagtatanong, Minette, no? ito bang reactogenicity na to? Does it, con- uh, does it connote na the vaccine is working? Or it's just a separate uh, event? It's a separate event because you trigger, yung, ini, yung pinag-usapan natin na immunogenicity, na-trigger mo na that it is a, it's a flag for the body saying that, oh, danger, danger, parang ganyan. And then, kaya sila magpo-produce na of all these factors para ma-trigger yes, na rin okay. yung cells or antibodies. So, what we're discussing now is actually valid for all vaccines. Tama? Yes. Apa. Okay. okay. Oh, huwag muna akong iopo. Ikaw naman. <laughs> o, oh, sige. O, oh, Alice. Oo, oh, oh, nasanay ka, no? Oh. Alice, ikaw, ano bang uh, nag-gather mong question dyan? So, uh, for the next question, we have, um, di ba we hear about uh, several vaccines available, no? We have uh, the most... Uh, uh, famous yung from Pfizer, Moderna, Sinovac, and AstraZeneca. Actually, there are other vaccines being developed, right? So, how effective are they? And what are the most uh, common adverse reaction of, uh, of these vaccines? Before I go to, the, to answer that question, can I explain the mechanics of the common vaccines? Para lang maintindihan. Okay lang. Okay lang. I'll go through my slides. Okay. Sure. So, you have a lot of uh, types, vaccine types, at least eight. And then, what we're seeing now, those with phase three trials are the non-replicating viral vector and the RNA vaccines. But WHO is reporting that you have more than 150 of the vaccines undergoing clinical trials, which is a good thing because we need all the vaccines that we can get. And then the I'll go back, I'll go straight to the to the vector vaccines. Okay. So, yan si vector vaccine. This just means that the vector, kaya siya vector, the, the virus as the vector is stripped of its essential genetic materials in order for it not to replicate. And then once the vaccine is injected, the viral vector will deliver the code, the genetic code, to our cells and will use the cells' uh, contents to produce and express a spike protein, which is the virulence factor for this virus and will trigger the immune response. Uh, I would like to explain it in a simpler analogy. I tried to, although this is an imperfect analogy, it can explain the mechanism of the viral vector vaccine. So you imagine yourself in your house or in a restaurant, you're, you ordered food, you're waiting for something, you ordered from Shopee or Amazon, and then you remember, try to remember that time when the delivery guy or the waiter came in with your order. 
Sobra kayong tuwa, di ba? Pero hindi kayo natuwa dahil nandun yung, dahil dun sa delivery guy or dun sa waiter. Natuwa kayo dun sa actual delivered product or the food. Ganon yung uh, mechanics for viral vectors. You just have some uh, virus, a non-replicating virus na nag-deliver ng contents. So, yun yung magti-trigger ng response. Okay. And then, you also have the nucleic acid vaccines, which are the mRNA. So, the mRNA will encode the spike protein that you will see here in the infographic. But you will also see in the right part, you will have a lipid nanoparticle. You need that lipid component because RNAs are not very stable and they need to be transported into the host. Okay. And then the RNA will use the cell, our cell's own contents to produce those spike proteins. And the mRNA will eventually be degraded by our own cells once they use up each other. And then no viral genetic material will be integrated into our DNA. Kasi hindi naman pumasok yung, yung mRNA na vaccine and its contents into our cells nucleus. Okay. So may analogy na naman ako dyan. Trinay ko. Imperfectly, it's like a last song syndrome, the mRNA vaccines. It's like you remember a particular part of that song, but you cannot sing the entire song. Ganun si mRNA. Yung, there's a part lang that you remember. For those who cannot relate to a last song syndrome, baka merong nagkakarelate sa the one that got away. Yeah. Yung mga the one that got away. So, for example, you have, um, you're in a, in a, currently in a relationship. Tapos, for some reason, naisip mo, si the one that got away. ba Parang, meron kang emo moment dyan. Yung feeling na yon yun yung effect ni mRNA vaccine. Okay? Pero, walang ginagawa yung totga na feeling na yon dun sa current relationship mo kasi wala naman siya dun sa'yo eve. Parang ganyan eh. Basta. Gets ba? Gets. <laughs> o lalo lang kayo nalito. Oh, <laughs> Nag-gets ko. Uh, kasi, oh, sige. <laughs> kasi LSS si Alice yung totga. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, now I go to the vaccine candidates that Dr. Alice was asking about. Um... It would be easier to place everything in a sl one slide and show only efficacy. But it's also important for us as future vaccinees to know schedule, okay? what are we expecting, okay? why is it important, and bakit magiging mabusisi yung proseso ng implementation in the vaccine sites. So we're talking about uh, the Moderna vaccine, unfortunately, there is a, the WHO emergency use listing is still ongoing, but they did 30, uh, they studied 30,000 participants in this trial. You have 18 years old and above 50%, almost 50% are females. 82% were considered high risk exposure and 25% of those 82% were uh, healthcare workers. Now, vaccine efficacy, like we discussed, was at 94%, occurring at least 14 days after the second dose. And look at the safety events data. Standard, pain, erythema, injection site. For the Moderna vaccine, they were reporting mga axillary lymphadenopathy. But the systemic manifestations, like we talked about, arthralgia, merong nausea, vomiting, fever, and headache. You will also see in this slide that the incidence of the serious adverse events Okay. in the vaccine arm, we're not uh, significantly different compared to placebo. So what is this saying? Even if they report this one, you have an independent group that evaluated kung um, talaga bang in related yung serious adverse event to the vaccination. And in the document uh, of the FDA, they listed everything eh, that was reported. And that is what we want to encourage for whatever vaccine, not only the COVID-19 vaccines, you have to list all the symptoms that you felt so that those will be evaluated properly. But the uh, contraindication for the Moderna, if you have anaphylaxis or a uh, reaction to the first dose as well, you cannot receive the second dose. 
For the Pfizer vaccine, this is the one with the ultra cold storage. It's a 21 day schedule given intramuscularly. Data wise, almost the same, more than 40,000 people in this trial. They studied those 16 years old and above. 95% uh, efficacy seven days after the second dose. And then in this data, you will see that they split it into local and systemic and subgroup them to those who experience the symptoms in the more than 55 and those below 55 years old. You will notice that the, the reaction to the vaccine is high also for the second doses. And again, the severe systemic events after the second dose is less than 2%. For the precautions and the contraindications for these vaccines, you will see that um, if the patient upon evaluation has severe allergic reaction to the polyethylene glycol content, that's already a contraindication. And like Moderna, if they developed a reaction to the first dose, yung mga severe allergic reaction, hindi na pwede yung second dose. But for a precaution, they stated in the FDA document that you cannot... Um, you just assess the patient regarding food allergies, contact allergies, or seasonal allergies. But should be deferred. Ito, standard for all vaccines to defer any vaccination if you have febrile illness or you're not feeling well at the time that you were scheduled to receive the vaccine. The non-replicating viral vac vector vaccine, one of them is the Astra it's a 6 to 12 week interval schedule, no special handling or preparation for this one. The new ones of the Astra trial is that you have four sites for the trial and you only have the phase three data for the one of the sites in UK and the one in Brazil. Yung isang site is, I think, in South Africa. So what are they looking at? They compared it with a meningococcal group A, CWI, that's a conjugate vaccine, a 70.4% efficacy at 14 days after the second dose. And then the same, you have local and systemic reactions, but the contraindication also the same as the other, severe allergic reaction to vaccine components. And then, ito kakalabas lang last, I think, Tuesday night. They came out with a phase 3 uh, data. Um, I haven't been able to put it here, but the nuance naman of the Gamelaya vaccine is that you have the standard vaccine and then you have a lyophilized type of the vaccine. They will split it. Ibig sabihin, um, you're using two viral vectors in this vaccine, which could be an advantage because um, in connection with immunogenicity, okay? And then they showed a zero conversion rate of 100% in all of those who received the vaccine in the earlier clinical trial phases. But in the phase three, it's, I believe, a 91% efficacy after the second dose. Okay, to prevent symptomatic COVID infection. And then you have almost the same again, local and systemic reactions. Um, I'll stop here, but you have other viral vector, ay, tama ba? Yeah, spike unit, sorry, spike unit vaccine. We're awaiting approval for this one as well. That's Novavax. And we also have the Coronavac, the one we all all know as Sinovac. Sinovac is the company. We, we know it as Coronavac. Dapat. So it's an inactivated virus, a schedule of day 0 and day 14 or day 28. And then they're saying that in the dosing schedule of the either 14 or day 28, immunogenicity-wise, you have good reactions for both groups regardless of the dose strength. Yeah. Yan, Dr. Alice. Sana nasa lutos okay. siya. May follow-up question, Dr. Gunet. Since yung sa Pfizer, 95% efficacy, uh, may mamamatay ba sa Pfizer? Pag ginamit ang Pfizer vaccine, may is there a chance na 
sa lahat ng mababakunahan ng Pfizer vaccine. Uh, may Pfizer prevent, vaccine? May prevent ah, from okay. death. Yeah. Are you mean that can it prevent severe severe, yes. uh, severe COVID and hospitalization or death? Yes. And ganyan. Ah, okay. The Health Technology Assessment uh, Council, the HTAC, came out with a document recently stating all these information regarding Pfizer. And they're saying the data that you see here regarding efficacy, nandun din siya. Um, there is a statement in that document that is saying, yes, it can prevent severe COVID infection and death. However, if you look at the confidence interval for that data, medyo wide siya. So the statement is saying there is low evidence at this time. And that might change naman if more information is gained when they um, evaluate after more time is given for this one. But it can. It can prevent okay. severe. Uh, so uh, another follow-up regarding this. No? Um, with Sinovac, AstraZeneca, and Moderna, diba? Is it true na 100% na walang death? Um, yes. Again, yes. But it's the same. It's the same when you sift through the data. The, the analysis is there is low evidence at this time. It's possible, but it has to be studied more. Yan yung parating nasa data. For across all those trials. Oh. All right. So for the for, uh, for the next question, um who should be vaccinated of terminate? And do we follow a certain rule of allocation and priority? Yeah, um yes. The DO uh, the national government has this national vaccine deployment plan. So they're talking about priority A is healthcare workers, senior citizens, and then the indigent population and uh, uniform personnel. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so hopefully makasama tayo no, sa priority. <laughs> We're definitely as infectious disease consultants, no, kasama kayo sa priority. Uh the, the the allocation po kasi based on the latest announcements are DOH referral centers first. Ah, okay. For the Pfizer supply that's coming in first. Okay, okay. May All right. follow up ako. Oo. Sige. Uh, among oh, these no. studies ba? Hindi. Kasi syempre mga pute and then tayo Asians, no? How well represented are the Asians here, no? Meron bang mm. difference yan in, in terms of immunogenicity, genetic compos- the disposition? The Baka lang may sub-analysis. Yeah. The Moderna data, this is the representation for communities of color. But you will see here Asians, five per, almost just 5%. Uh, I haven't seen the statement from Astra saying from the other from the trial sites if or how much of Asian population yung kasama nun sa study nila. But they're saying that since they're reporting a general vaccine efficacy dun sa phase three, eto na yung masusunod, eto na yung expected, regardless of uh, race or color. Okay. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Eh, on that note, <laughs> Minette, of the vaccines na, that you presented, four and then possibly six, no? Okay. Yeah. Uh, kung meron ba tayong choice, or ikaw, kung meron kang choice, <laughs> or as an infectious disease, at kung may choice ba ang Pilipinas, what to receive? Ano kaya yon? Which ah. one? Or which of them? Oh, siguro. Okay. Uh, marami na akong beses na tanong yan. My Correct. answer is always the same. That 
if it's FDA approved, WHO uh, assessed, vaccine efficacy, maganda, receive any of the vaccines. Any po yun eh. Any. And then, yung sa question niya po na which will be available, what's coming in is the one that's assessed already by not only FDA but also WHO. So that's why you're hearing about Pfizer. And then the next one, the most recently that was approved, is the AstraZeneca. I see. Pero lang ako curious question in it. Pag nasa study ka ba, let's say you received the placebo. Oh, hmm. after the study, will you be vaccinated? Ah, that's a process or system in the clinical trial. It requires parang it's also a data privacy thing. So you will yes. hear about unblinding the ah, okay. clinical trials. Mm-hmm. Kapag nakita mm-hmm. na you were mm-hmm. um, randomized into the placebo group, isyempre, mm-hmm. oh, i- saka ka na bi- hihingan ulit ng consent if you want to receive the vaccine. Ah, but it okay. requires parang uh, another consent na pwede nang mag-release uh, or mag-unblind ng data. Okay. So, so far, no? Ako, yung okay. mga questions ko sa isip ko, Alice, uh, nalilinawan, sure. tsaka yung confidence kong sumagot, di ba? Sa mga nagtatanong na pasyente. Si Alice yan, may tanong yan, kasi si Alice is ano eh, a pediatrician. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's another question here, ano? Uh, can we mix vaccines? Meaning, if the first dose, ang binigay ay Moderna, eh, yung second dose, pwede bang Pfizer? Or ah. pwede bang Pfizer? Parang ano, mix and match, kanya. Yes. Pwede ba yun? Um, by theory, it can. And there are studies ongoing that studying this one because the current trials, hindi yun ang ginawa nila, di ba? Kasi nga, it's their vaccine. Mm-hmm. It's the company's vaccine. But theoretically, it can be done. They're looking to the effect of doing the mix and match. But so far, if you will look into the WHO um, document, they're not recommending even the documents for the vaccines. They're not recommending switching brands at this time until they know what will happen. The issue of mixing and matching will be because the it's a supply thing. You mm-hmm. cannot say, di ba, kailan darating na yung next supply, baka naman pwedeng itong other mRNA vaccine kasi nga, yun yung available. But available. the recommendation, also nationally, the recommendation is receive both uh, the same vaccine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if I miss the second dose, okay lang ba yun? Ah, the pasaway. Second dose. It's a no, as much as possible. Kasi that's why we emphasize then that they um, stick to the schedule because the studies are saying ito yung efficacy eh, with the two doses, if it's a two-dose schedule. And you want to gain as much efficacy, di ba? as possible. Now, in the real world, effectiveness, mas maganda. And then, um, the other, parang follow-up question, I think there would be, kung na-miss mo, kailan mo pwede ulit tanggapin? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, for the Pfizer vaccine, if you miss that second dose, they say it should, uh, you receive the late dose, yung pahabol na dose, within six weeks of the, supposedly the schedule. Meron naman din yung mga masyadong maaga, excited, okay, na pumunta, hindi pa sila schedule So, kung kunwari dun sa 28 or 28-day cycle, standard or general principle of vaccination is four days. Within four days of the 21-day schedule, pwede. Pwede yon Pero if you're late, you don't have to repeat the whole schedule for both doses. But for the Pfizer vaccine, particularly, dapat within 42 days or 6 weeks, natanggap mo yung na-late na dose. Ayun. So, 
Pwede naman pala. Yung mga ano, mga special population, let's say yung mga COVID uh, survivors natin, no? Uh, do they need a vaccine? Do they need swabbing before they receive a vaccine? Ano ba ang parang hmm. recommendations? Marami tayong ano, di ba, na who survived COVID. Sige. COVID survivors, these are mostly healthcare workers then, so priority Correct. as well. Um there's no need, they're not recommending doing a swab just to check or an antibody test for that matter to check if you uh, should receive the vaccine or not. May tanong si Alice about ito, yung for those vaccinated naman. For those vaccinated, uh, they can still have the disease, right? Pwede pa rin silang ma-infect, even vaccinated. Tama? Uh, yes. Yes, if, lalo na kung... If, if they get infected, they can also transmit the disease to to another person. Yes. Like, to their family members, gano'n. Pwede. Pwede. Um, the instance for... Kunwari, I received the first dose today. It's not... My immune system has not picked up yet. Tapos, uh, preventive health measures, di ko sinunod. Exposure risk, anjan siya. But so the chance na I will develop the uh, infection and transmit to family members, nandun siya. Yun yung nabalita natin um, earlier part of the year where they started vaccinating and then they were reporting that PCR positive. So yun yung panahon na yan. Pero to say that you receive the vaccine and then can you transmit it? Okay? Kasi nga, just because of the vaccine, ah. Um, they're studying that as well. They want to see if the transmission actually occurs. And there are some news reports right now regarding that. But mm-hmm. if you look through the news reports, they don't explain how they evaluated yung ganong statement na people can transmit mm-hmm. post-vaccination. So, uh, follow-up naman dito sa mga vaccinated... How long naman will they be protected? How long? In the phase three trials, <laughs> in the phase three trials, <laughs> the they're saying it's a uh, three to four months. I saw one article that came out. There's a six months, but this is not a peer-reviewed article yet. And then um, there is a possibility yung sinabi ni Dr. Tina na pwede ba siyang parang annual ang mangyayari. That so depends on the, yes, an annual vaccination. Posible. Um, kasi, syempre yung ano natin, no, uh, we as clin- clinical physicians or practicing doctors, iba-iba tayo. May OB, may geria, may pedia. Meron bang, sa studies kasi, nakita ko Pfizer 16 years old, no? So, medyo pedia pa yon but no lower than 16, no? Pero wala namang sinabi about the very elderly or the pregnant, mga ganyan. O, meron ba tayong um, precautions or uh, pwedeng i-advise? Lalo na yung mga very elderly. Sa elderly population, the data for Astra... They're saying they're saying very low efficacy, but that's just because by the time they enrolled all the uh, elderly individuals, yung cut of data for evaluating information, umabot sila dun eh. So, konti lang yung nasale, okay. but they're extending extending all that um, analysis. So, I, I, I believe ongoing na yung pag-analyze ng information nung nahabol na number of elderly. For the pregnant patients, um, by uh, WHO is saying for pregnant patients and the special populations like those immunocompromised hosts, it's a risk-benefit assessment. Now, for the pregnant patients who are healthcare workers, syempre, risk, di ba? Mataas yung risk nila for exposure. You encourage that they get vaccinated. Encourage yun, ha? hindi ipilit. Hindi din naman na wag mong banggitin 
or in this mm-hmm. way, hindi siya ganon. It's also the same for the immunocompromised patients because you will have to explain as physicians that the studies did not include a lot of this um, people or individuals. So, we cannot say what is the vaccine efficacy, lalo na if they're taking immunosuppressive meds, or um, what will be the safety or adverse events data that will come out. Baka hindi pumitek, meaning they might not develop antibodies. So, tamang sabihin na looking at yourself, ano ba muna yung risk mo? Di ba? No, regardless siguro of age, no? being an adult, no? Although wala talagang study sa mga pedya. No? Siguro tanong eh, oh, yung mga anti ko dyan na nagtatanong, pabakuna kayo, ha? <laughs> so, yung Pero may risk, ongoing tama, na. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. May ongoing for pedya. Oh, ah, alis. Mm. Kasi, <laughs> kasi papasok sa skwela, di ba? I mean, siyempre, Pasok alam nga na uh, keep them. Mag-transmit din. So, Alicia, meron ka pa bang mga tanong dyan na pinasa sa'yo na hindi pa nasagot? Oo. But for other I questions? No? Oo. Like, isa na lang. For the COVID survivor, survivors pala, how soon can they get the vaccine? Okay. Uh, parang i... Ano yan eh? I... Go group mo yan. Symptomatic and then depends on their category. If they receive, kunwari, severe or critical, they receive convalescent plasma or the uh, immunomodulatory oh. like tocilizumab, you have to wait 90 days before uh, recommending that they receive the vaccine. Tapos for those naman na uh, nag-positive pero asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, you have to complete the isolation period for those who are symptomatic. So that's at least 14 days, and then you can recommend the vaccine. Okay. Pero sa trials kasi, sa trials, they did it longer eh. Lalo na dun sa symptomatic. They followed the 90 days. Para sigurado, three, wala nang effect yeah, yung mga sigurado. treatment. Yeah. Oo. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we had a very productive evening, no? And just to sum up uh, ang ating mga important uh, points here, no? So, of course, effectivity, efficiency, importante, no? But we are here now at the time of our pandemic wherein the protection that these vaccines will give us is our prime consideration, Okay, so I hope our audience developed a more positive and a more correct attitude into vaccination against COVID-19. Hindi na natin nabanggit, pero of course, yung prevention will always be there. No? Meron tayong uh, <laughs> mga unspoken rule na hindi natin dapat bubuwagin, yung pagmamask, social distancing, washing of hands. So we are now in the next phase of this pandemic resolution, which is vaccination. Now, um, hopefully, within the year, I'm not sure, Minet, kung alam mo, but uh, hopefully we will be receiving no, our uh, vaccines this first quarter or second quarter. So hanggang sa panahon na yon, dapat lagi tayong mag-iingat. No? Alice, ikaw, anong masasabi mo? So, uh, I hope by now, we are uh, now enlightened regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. So it's now our turn to educate our patients regarding the importance of uh, getting vaccinated. So yun. So kailangan natin educate yung mga patients natin uh, regarding the importance. Kailangan magpapakuna tayo natin. Hi. Pero I'll emphasize lang that yeah. I'll emphasize yes, lang that yes, minute. Oh. vaccines are not just the answer to everything. That's why even if you yes. are vaccinated, you will still continue, everyone still continues to wear their 
face mask, face shield, hand hygiene, social distancing. And of course, engineering controls are important. Yan. Diagnostic and testing, um, contact, uh, contact tracing is also important. Tracing. So all those are the steps where you want to prevent. Okay? Because placing them all together um, reduces significantly the transmission of the virus. Yeah. Saka syempre lahat tayo magdadasal, no? <laughs> na ma-overcome natin to, no? Na kahit na hindi tayo siguro priority, sabi natin, no? Sa bakuna. Okay, everyone, I think our session has been very very productive, informative, no? So salamat ng marami, Minette, Claire, Rosario for your time with us. Batch uh the silver jubilarians and kayo rin, hopefully when your turn comes we can do something for you during your celebration yes. i hope it will be more uh you know a more interactive face to face baka pwede na okay. so salamat back to our studio good evening good evening Thank you very much, Dr. Minette, Dr. Tina, and Dr. Alice, and all the participants for this lively exchange of information. I hope this session dissipated our fears and enlightened our minds regarding the issues surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine. Let us now proceed to our third and last topic, the impact of cardiovascular disease and the risk factors on fatal outcomes in patients with COVID-19. We have a cardiologist and an endocrinologist to share with us their thoughts. Dr. Simonette Christine Sawit Rodrigo is an active staff in Cardiovascular Institute of the Medical City. She also heads the Advanced Cardiac Imaging and is the director of the Heart Failure Critical Care Program of the same institution. She is an active staff at the cardiology section of Makati Medical Center. She is also the chair of the Committee on Cardiovascular Imaging of the Philippine Heart Association. Dr. Simon also serves as one of the faculty of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Robert Michael Gan had his internal medicine training at Makati Medical Center. He had his fellowship in endocrinology at Westmead Hospital in Australia. He is a past president, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, Philippine chapter. He is the Medical Bureau Coordinator, Diabetes Center, Philippines, and a team doctor of the Blackwater Elite Basketball Team. Dr. Mike is an active consultant at the Makati Medical Center and Metropolitan Medical Center. The moderator for this session is the batch crooner, Dr. Rodney Jimenez, a practicing interventional cardiologist. Dr. Rodney is an associate professor at the UERM College of Medicine. He is the director, Philippine Heart Association Board. He is also the training officer in Adult Cardiology Fellowship, Heart Institute, St. Luke's Global City. Good evening, guys. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, doc, again, I'm Dr. Rodney Jimenez. I, uh, thank you, Beth, for the introduction. Uh, we will discuss today, this evening, about the cardiometabolic um, uh, risk factors of Filipino people. Bakit mataas yung diabetes? Bakit mataas ang um, CAD or ischemic heart disease or sakit sa puso or hypertension among Filipinos. No? So again, along with me is Dr. Simonette Sawit. Uh, she was already introduced to you as cardiologist and Dr. Robert Michael Gan, uh, an endo endocrinologist. And my co-moderator is Dr. Val Garcia, who is an ENT a specialist um, also, a diabetic and hypertensive patient. Sorry, Vala, kung inanunakita. Binukunakita. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So, marami pa, marami. <laughs> wala, di, oh. ano, walang, ano, walang patient doctor, ano to? Uh, uh, confidentiality. Confidentiality, okay. okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> para ano, para sweet, para coming from the heart pag nagtanong ka mami. <laughs> Robert, okay. So, my first question, uh, sa, sa inyo Simon and um, Robert, no? Mike, Mike Gunn. Um, what percentage of the world's population or in the Philippine population um, affected ang diabetes, ischemic heart disease, or hypertension in the Philippines? Ilan ba, gano'n ba siya kadami? Ilan ba tayo mga Pilipinang diabetic and ano, may mataas, may mataas ang blood pressure? Simon? Yeah, should I take this? Hi, good evening. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, that's a very good question. So um, the percentage of hypertension in the Philippines is actually about 23%. And if you compare this with our Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, we're pretty much the same 23% as compared to more advanced Southeast Asian nations like Singapore, 14% only. Um, and of course, in the in the U.S. and Europe, they have a lower percentage, slightly lower percentage of hypertension. So hypertension is still quite uh, common you know, globally and even more here in the Philippines. And I think we'll be tackling that as we go along this session. Okay. Mike? Yes, Rodney, thank you. Um, as, as you know, we're having this pandemic right now, this COVID pandemic, but maybe... What is the real pandemic or they branded this as global epidemic before, but maybe we can call this pandemic because uh, diabetes is long term. In the world we have right now by the International Diabetes Federation data, the IDF, we have 463 million in the world and they project that by 2045, it would increase by 51% to approximately 700 million. In the Western Pacific, uh, there are around, which the Philippines is in, uh, 163 million already. And by 2045, they project, if it doesn't improve, 212 million. In the Philippines, we have around 6.3 prevalence rate of diabetes. So that's approximately 4 million already. Quite a number. Well, uh, parang mas mataas yung hypertension ano, na prevalence than the diabetes. No? So, um, um, yeah, Rodney, you're correct. Uh, in fact, uh, at Medical City, we have this heart failure program. And we looked at the data from pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. And the top four uh, cardiometabolic risk factors for heart attack and stroke or even for heart failure would be hypertension followed by diabetes uh, and then uh, smoking is actually up there, three, number three or number four, mm-hmm. and dyslipidina, which is still, uh, which is quite scary, you know, because um, there's a lot of issues or problems right now in terms of risk factor control, risk factor modifi- modification among Filipinos. And part of the problem really is not that the doctors aren't doing our jobs for the doctors are doing their jobs, but sometimes I think the, the most uh, important problem right now is compliance uh, or adherence to medications. You know? mm-hmm. okay. um, surprisingly, our patient adherence, is, if a patient already had an event such as a heart attack and a stroke, the adherence rate to medication is about 60% only, and that is in the US, US data, 60% adherence. So I'm assuming, uh, although there aren't that many studies locally, I'm assuming that among Filipinos that the adherence rate is much lower. And for those patients who have not had a heart attack or a stroke or coronary event, meaning they have the risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, they haven't had an event. Uh, we're doing our jobs as physicians, we're giving our treatment, but the adherence is as low as 40%. And that is why, um, heart disease or ischemic heart disease is still the number one killer uh, here in the Philippines and worldwide. Mm-mm. Nakita ko ngayon sa, DO, sa DOH data and, uh, and sa WHO. No? I thought 
sa Philippines pneumonia yung ano yung mataas yung the, the number one cause of mortality in the Philippines but na surprise din ako na talagang hanggang ngayon is ischemic heart disease kasi dapat parang covid na siya or even before parang mataas yung pneumonia sa mga field health field health um, diagnosis no pero yung pala ischemic heart disease pa Val you have a question yes. for, for the music. um Ayun, alam ko na na I'm not alone. No? Marami pa lang may, may diabetes and high blood pressure. Anyway, uh, do you think that diabetes is on the rise in the Philippines? If so, why? So, for diabetes, yes. As I've said, the uh, prevalence was around 6.3 and it's, also, it's always, every year, it's always increasing. Uh, what's the reason for this? As you know that um, we have this increase uh, urbanization and westernization in the Philippines. I'm not saying that's bad. Of course, uh, we need uh, the country needs to progress. But of course, when there's progress, lifestyle might be sacrificed. As you know, uh, we um, right now everyone is busy. Sometimes they can't eat well. They have to resort to fast food. So, and then when they go home, they're tired. There, there will be a lifestyle change instead of exercising or um, doing some activities. They will resort to just sleeping or just have a, uh, just watch TV and rest. And for our kids right now, as you, I think you notice, we're already in the computer world. So yeah. instead of playing, this was even be, uh, before pandemic. They don't go outside anymore. They don't play anymore. What they do is just stay play games in their iPad or computer, right? Even if not, if they don't play, they just text. That's true. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lifestyle change. Uh, yeah, you, uh, Simon and uh, no, Mike, do you have any idea? Kung alim, ay, sinabi niyo pa kanina kung mas mataas yung sa US or sa Philippines parin mas mataas. Kasi I, I, if you can see the the mga shows sa sa TV or sa news, di ba? Ang lalaki ng mga Amerikano, ang lalaki. Dito ba rin ba sa Philippines, ganun din ba tayo? Yung obesity, uh, tumataas din? Parang ganun din ba? And why? Bakit ganun yung ano natin? Bakit ganun yung itsura natin? Ah, anyway, tayo naman mukha tayong payat, no? <laughs> <laughs> um, Rodney, that's a very good point. Um, in fact, if you've noticed that the children right now are actually starting to get bigger than their parents um you know we're filipinos and our diet is really we're rice eaters kasi. and over the last 10 years it's been quite common for us to go to buffets eat all you can unlimited rice and this you know it's this is a temptation for for us even for for the for our kids and then you know the sugary drinks the upsize your french fries for example or upsize your drink no and food is actually not expensive here in fact the healthy food like salad um, fish that's actually more expensive than the unhealthy food like barbecue and fried all our fried food and, and fast food so that's going to be a problem if we don't address it Obesity is on the rise. Um, and even if Filipinos are mostly small built, uh, skinny actually, but I think this is going to change if we don't start with our, our children. Mm. Mike, um, what, what can you say? Yes, I agree with uh, Simon. Obesity is on the rise with the same reason, urbanization and westernization. Uh, same reason like diabetes, Less activity, more food, and sedentary lifestyle. Having said that, are we are you aware of any programs para hindi hindi tayo magkaganyan? Because I can remember a big trial. I don't know if you're familiar with the Pure Trial, no? So, parang it uh, it it tackled or it researched on the lifestyle of people, ano, ano yung pinakamataas na kukos ng 
mortality sino sino, sino sa buong mundo yung nagkakaroon ng mas mataas na mortality and doon nakita yung mga rice eaters like the Southeast Asians kaya daw mataas yung diabetes at hypertension because of the increase in um ang tawag nito glucose or uh, starch na yung kinakain nila so meron ba tayong ongoing programs dito sa Philippines na para ma-stop na natin yung kakakain natin ng <laughs> maraming rice? <laughs> are, we, are, are you aware of the, those programs? Meron ba tayong ganun, Mike? Mike, do we have? <laughs> yes. Okay. Way back, uh, let's just say 1993, we were just, uh, we were med students. That time, second year, we were studying our Pathology, what else? Parasitology, <coughs> pharmacology. Yeah. Anyway, ni- during 1993, the group of Dr. Lee Don Hua, he's the father of Philippine endocrinology, his group, the Philippine Center for Diabetes Education Foundation, uh, uh, brought this up to President Fidel Ramos at that time. So they uh, signed Proclamation 213, which is declaring every fourth week as Diabetes Awareness Week. So I know you heard of several Awareness Week of different illnesses like uh, Stroke Awareness Week, Goiter Awareness Week, but this Diabetes Awareness Week, every fourth week of July, fourth Sunday of July, is uh, legal. It was signed by President Ramos. And what is this program? Of course, the name itself, Diabetes Awareness Week, to promote diabetes through Uh, information via uh, trimedia. They talk about diabetes, uh, doctors guesting in TV shows, discussing about diabetes, the, to eat healthy, the, the, pro- pro- the proper diet. And also, they also have programs tied up with uh, different diabetes clinics in the hospitals, in the barangays, to monitor to, or to have mass screening for the, of their blood sugar. And of course, just, it's, a, it's not just taking the blood sugar, but of course, they They will discuss the results and they will uh, teach also during the consultation. And of course, there are other programs, but the uh, like f- different uh, different societies they have their different programs, like the Philippine Society of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, Diabetes Philippines, and the AACE Philippines. But the main to fight diabetes is still the, uh, the Diabetes Awareness Week, which they're all involved. Mm, okay. And then, of course, Rodney, don't forget, as you and I are both in the Philippine Heart Association, PCC, and we do have programs and activities to address the number one uh, uh, cause or number one killer uh, worldwide and locally, which is heart disease. We do have, uh, we do celebrate World Heart Day. Uh, that's every September. And then, of course, uh, every February, and the reason why I'm wearing red is we do celebrate uh, Heart Healthy Month in February. Yeah. And um, during World Heart Day celebration or Healthy Heart Month in February every year, we do um, have some activities, if not through our college, you know, in the different hospitals, uh, the, sec- the cardiology section, to promote um, healthy, healthy heart you know, addressing risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, dyslipidemia, and uh, lifestyle changes, you know. But I think what's also more important is to go to the barangay level uh, yeah. because uh, there aren't that, not everybody is fortunate enough to attend these programs. So we do have activities with the PHA, PCC, and the different chapters of our society or even the society of endocrinology where we try to disseminate this information um, outside the city or in the barangay levels. So I think that we do have the programs there. We just have to be reminded about it. And I think unfortunately because of this pandemic uh, time, uh, most people are just within their homes You know, but we try to do as much as we can, you know, through yeah. this online activity, through conventions, through uh, webinars, and even online. If you just want to search, how do I address my hypertension? How do I address my diabetes? You can go online 
in the different societies there have all a vast amount of information to address these problems. So education is really key. It's not just medication uh, given by the doctors, but education, learning and teaching and promoting a healthy, healthy lifestyle, whether if it's for the heart, the, the brain, the kidneys, and the, or the different organs, it's, it's all there, the, the information. So, so having said that, I think you already tackled uh, some of the gaps no, for achieving the, uh, the goals for decreasing the cardio, cardiometabolic or cardiovascular burden in the Philippines, pati in diabetes. No? Ikaw, Mike, ano pa sa tingin mo ang gaps na, na parang na dapat nat natin idugtong para ma-achieve natin yung goals na mabagsak natin yung um, prevalence rate ng diabetes sa Philippines? Still education and the practice of the people. Even the, uh, they know what to avoid, but they don't practice it. Why? Maybe it's not available. Uh, like as uh, Dr. Simon said, she uh, fish and vegetables might be, the salads might be more expensive. Yeah. So instead of they know what to eat, but they, can't, they don't want to spend that much, so they will uh, buy the fast food, which is cheaper. And uh, go, let's go back again, sorry, Rodi, about the Diabetes Awareness Week. It's not only for endocrinologists or diabetologists, but for everyone who can help teach uh, against diabetes. This, every year, they have different team, which is also on that specific time. Like, for example, when uh, Smart Gilas was playing, so the team was about basketball. When it's about COVID, it was also COVID. So this year, the team will be about TikTok. So <laughs> through virtual, they'll do TikTok to, to spread against diabetes. And hopefully, I can invite our alumni to join this, this campaign. I will post it when, it, when it's ready. Okay. Merong, merong online question dito. Tapos, and may, can I call uh, Dr. Shira Recto Brown? If you have any question, yes, Shira. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to ask questions as not only one of your classmates. Ano, I, I, I'm also a member of the Diabetes Philippines. But like Val, I'm also a patient. Hypertensive. And <laughs> I didn't. I have... <laughs> Sabi ko nga, hindi lang ako nag yeah, <laughs> Like Mike have said that I know um, there's so many information out there, but sometimes it's so difficult to actually actually filter what you what you need. I know, like I'm checking lang sa Facebook. You have like um, so many groups. I'd like to ask, ano ba yung ano in your in your case? What do you tell your patients about yung about diet? Like there is this ongoing fad diets especially yung ketogenic ones um an ano ba ang dapat talaga um minsan kasi ano eh naiinganyo ka pero baka mamaya hindi pwede sa akin ayun so i'd like to pose that question to you guys okay there are so many okay. yes <laughs> there are so many diets but if you'll ask what is the best diet the answer is all of them are good it, de it depends how you design it for your patient. Okay? So, before the ketogenic or intermittent fasting, the most common in hospital setting would be the total caloric requirement. You, based on the ideal body weight, the lifestyle, you do the computation. Like, for example, uh, 1,600 calories, and then you divide it to 50, 20, 30, 50% carbohydrate, 20% fat and 30% protein. And then, so, and here I tell the dietitian to instruct the patient how to eat this low calorie diet. So, which is good. And also the most, it's the next diet would be the Idaho plate method. I know everyone knows this, the, or they call it the Pingan Pinoy. Usually as uh, earlier that, uh, Simon said about most of us, we eat rice. Half of the plate is rice. But here in this, uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, the half of the plate should be vegetables. 
and you have an imaginary one fourth your carbohydrates and then the another one fourth would be your protein source and that's the plate method which is easy to explain and for the patients easy to follow for your ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting if you want to have weight loss they are good but in terms of uh, blood sugar control for intermittent fasting versus the low calorie diet they're just the same uh, and wow. also in terms of weight loss low calorie diet versus intermittent fasting more or less the same there's one study that maybe 12% so sorry but 12 pounds 12 pounds uh, after the the end of the study was the intermittent fasting while for the low calorie diet was approximately just 13 pounds so more or less they're just the same mm-hmm. but in terms of also blood sugar control both of them are the same mm-hmm. may pakiulit yeah. mo nga yung ano yung plate plate gra- ano eh? plate graph mo na yeah the I, the sorry in this uh, picture the plate as you can see half of the plate usually our diet is half of the plate is rice but here Half of the plate should be vegetables. Ah, half of the plate should be vegetables. And then the imaginary one fourth would be your carbohydrate, like one cup of rice or a portion of uh, if your pasta. Uh-huh. And then the other one fourth, as you can see, would be your protein source. Ikaw, Simon, paano niyo na maintain yung, yung figure <laughs> ni yung dalawa? Napayat kayo. <laughs> to be honest, I usually tell my patients actually that they can actually eat honestly a person can eat whatever they want right yeah but having said that everything in moderation and this is you can get really carried away with all the diets that are available out there um like shira had mentioned so much information there but you have to trust the site of where you get these information regarding diet for example if the U.S., then um, I always say American Heart Association uh, mm-hmm. website. Here, I, oh, I say Philippine Heart Association website or the local, um, the local uh, society's website. Now, you know, each, each patient because it's different. So depending on what that patient needs, for example, the, you know, if the patient has uh, renal insufficiency, for example, or if the patient had just had the bypass or stents. So each patient is different. So I think the, the logical thing to do is to discuss, uh, discuss this with, your, with the doctors, the cardiologists, the endocrinologists, and maybe tie up with the nutrition medicine so that you can get the right amount of calories without harming the heart, the brain, the kidneys, or the liver. For example, the ketogenic diet, that would probably be good for somebody who does who did not have a heart attack or stroke ketogenic diet. Yeah. And yeah. yes, people do lose weight on ketogenic diet. And some people ask me for clearance to go on ketogenic diet. And so what they do is I check their profile first, yeah. you know, making sure that everything is, isn't that uh, uncontrolled. And I allow them to do this for maybe three months, you know, because all you need to do is lose the weight. When you lose the weight after three months, it's the maintenance phase already. So you don't yeah. really need to lose weight mm-hmm. all the time. You know, you have some goals. So I think it just makes sense for, for patients to discuss this with their doctors you know, and nutritionists um, before starting on any of these uh, fad, fad diets. But as I said, Honestly, it, you can eat whatever you want, everything in moderation, and depending on what illness or disease that you have, you have to tailor fit your diet to um, the specific needs uh, of your body. Yeah, Tsaka meron, meron nirelease din yung Philippine Heart Association along with the, uh, the Philippine Society of Endocrinology and uh, Diabetes. Parang kasama yun sa statement that if you want to go into... Um, ketogenic and intermittent fasting uh, one year lang nire-recommend nila na dapat pati wala silang uh, comorbid illness no? so uh, pwede yon na uh, pang lose ng weight pero ang problema din yung pag maintain no alam naman lagi silang nagano ng uh, diet nila di ba correct so, correct yeah. 
I mean, hand in hand with diet, Rodney is also exercise. We can't just do diet and take Ooh. medications. Ooh. You have to exercise and you don't need to have washboard abs or like a really <laughs> fit body. You just need to exercise 30 minutes a day. And that exercise entails walking for brisk walking for 30 minutes every day if you can or most days during the week and it's free you yes. know so that's all we need now for the younger folks if they want to look they shampered they're after the look now then they can go to the gym and do whatever they want but those with uh, the older folks with diabetes hypertension and all these comorbidities have to take it easy but 30 minutes of walking a day is all you need or at least four times a week. That's all you need, really, for yeah. for a for a healthy heart. Actually, sa sa, sa American Heart Association nga, di ba parang ang sabi lang it just move, galaw ka lang para <laughs> <laughs> galaw ka lang ng uh, galaw, no? So para hindi na kailangan nung stricto on the time, parang ganon, parang binabaan nila yung pagka strict nila. So ayon. And then, do you think part of the gap? Nang, uh, achieving these goals would be the doctors also kasi hindi sila masyadong marunong mag-educate and actually hindi nila alam kung paano educate yung mga tao and minsan pag sinabi nila na that this medication should be given uh, indefinitely or lifetime parang do you think part tayo ng mga bl- to blame? I'd like to answer that well Firstly, not everything is addressed with a pill. The basic lifestyle changes. I mean, yeah. common sense. I think the biggest gap right now really is the adherence to medication, adherence yeah. to diet. It's really adherence to what the doctor prescribed. You know? mm-hmm. Because, for example, for us cardiologists, our patients are taking probably 8 to 10 to 12 pills a day. So that's polypharmacy. You're taking multiple pills. So for a patient, you that's a lot on the pocket. And sometimes taking too many pills, it gets confusing. And you know, you you might forget to take a pill, or you might try to save um, and not take the maybe not take the statins because most patients think that the priority is the hypertension pill or the diabetes pill, but they don't know that all of these uh, work for them together if they can. And so there are so many ways we can improve adherence, which would be, you know, there are pills right now, the two-in-one pill, three-in-one pill, uh, multiple pills in one. So single pill combination, that's one. And two is just following up these patients uh, regularly every three months to make sure that they lose weight, that they're taking their medications. And for doctors, we only fill the prescription for three months so that they will come back and get their prescriptions filled for a new uh, prescription. That ensures that they're taking their pills and that they're being monitored um, by the doctor. Mike? Partly, maybe, yes. I have to agree with, not agree with uh, Rodney, but not all. uh. Some doctors, they don't explain to the patient. I'm not talking about food, but maybe in general. Sometimes I have patients coming to me. They're asking me, do I really need to take this injection for my knee? For example, I said, why ask me? Why don't you ask your doctor? And mm-hmm. he will, the patient will say, no, mama, the young doctor, etc. And so forth. So yeah. partly, sometimes, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that also. I just tell them to go to the dietitian to... Uh, to learn about the low calorie diet yeah, so yeah. but hopefully the dietitian will uh, teach them properly but in my part sometimes i especially merienda the time i emphasize that merienda the time or the snack time is very hard to follow mm-hmm. in lunch, during lunch time they can eat their vegetables but in uh, dinner time you can also ask your patients i'm no, sorry snack time you can ask your patients that what do they eat so most of the time they'll say turon Bihon, pizza, mm-hmm. burger, so which is unhealthy. Because they don't eat carrots on during snack. Eh. So uh-huh. what I do in, with the plate method, for the snack, I tell them to have this meal replacement drink or meal replacement shake. It's not a milk, but it's, uh, it's a full meal, full meal already. 
they just uh, pour it and then put, uh, just put water and then drink it. That is there for their snack already. Yeah. Uh, meron I won't give I... an example. Oh, sige, go ahead. I, I won't give an example. Okay. It's brand, eh? But it's always in the TV. <laughs> Oh, nga. Wait, uh, we have a question from Shira again. Uh, Shira? Anyway, I'm, I'm asking, has the, the pandemic um, affected your consultations? And um, I'll, I'll lump it na lang. Um, do you do your consultations online, like yung telemed? And do you give your patients now because it's more challenging, more leeway, leeway to call you whenever they, they need to? Yes, so um, in this time of pandemic, it's really, it's now a new normal to have teleconsultation. I think most, if not all of the doctors are providing teleconsultation, um, especially to reach out to the senior citizens or those who cannot come to the hospital for, because of their chronic medical illness. Um, yes, I, I, I do give my emails uh, and then they have a uh, direct line to my secretary. But um, this pandemic has definitely affected our consultation, our doctor-patient relationship, only because uh, our patients right now are, one, they're afraid to go to the hospital and see their doctors. We are very limited during teleconsultation with what we can do because we can only see the patient, we can hear their complaints, but we cannot do the physical examination. But then again, some consultation or follow-up is better than none at all, diba? And a lot of these, the reason why um, our cardiac patients uh, get even, get sicker this time of uh, COVID is because they weren't able to fill their prescriptions. They haven't been able to see their doctor. They're just sitting down doing nothing, not exercising. And they're eating whatever it is, you know, is delivered to their home and mostly fast food. So um, hopefully things will change. But I think there is the um, communication between the doctor and the patient has always been open uh, during this new normal uh, pandemic uh, setup. So it's really not an excuse not to see your patient or for the patient not to be able to reach you. Because, um, you know, tele teleconsult, uh, phoning questions, consult, so these all work. Anything to have that open communication with the patient um, and hopefully reduce their risk of getting sicker or getting sick, whether it's they get COVID or they have a heart event like stroke or heart attack. Okay, uh, meron, akong, meron daw dito isang question from Edjam. Edjam, can you ask the question? Are you there? Hi. Pat tayo tuloy, Raji. On the spot. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. uh, uh, since we're talking, this segment is actually about, ano, okay ka ba, Doki? Eh? Yung, yung the last three segments. And uh, the question goes like, what will be your advice to our colleagues uh, who are afflicted with these uh, comorbids? Uh, should they treat themselves? Is that uh, logical or is that even uh, reasonable? Or should they just uh, go and seek consult with their colleagues? Ano daw, ano daw, kung dapat ba tayong mga doktor na afflicted with diabetes and hypertension, ischemic heart disease, should we treat ourselves? <laughs> Parang ako yan, ah. <laughs> Mamaya ka sasagot. That's hard to answer. <laughs> That's hard to answer without offending people. But uh, Mike, you want to take this? For me, you can. Yes, if you know how yes you can and then just ask advice from your friends am i on mute sorry you can ask advice from your friends uh who has more knowledge or if you can share ideas but yes you can because in the first place you're a doctor 
you can treat yourself but of course uh to remove that pride factor if you feel that you're here to ask questions you to ask help then then you should not you should i mean you should there's a time you should seek consult if he did ma manage na. but yeah but it, to go back yes pwede ikaw Simon tinong ano uh, mas maganda bang patingin ka na sa kaibigan ng doktor no but you know we do treat ourselves right so yeah. we treat ourselves um, for the time being that we could not see the specialist for example it's sunday yeah. uh, nine o'clock at night but it also depends on what you're treating if it's something that is that needs to be addressed on an urgent basis then you know it's a trip to the emergency room or at least a quick call uh, basically as doctors we can treat ourselves for the first stage of what you're feeling and then seek uh, seek consult from the specialist right away you know, because Let's- sometimes they're not They're not available 24/7. For example. Yeah. So let's ask an uh, Val. Val, since uh, yes, you're yes. a doctor and uh, <laughs> also, what do you think? Actually, na isip ko nga masarap pa yung iba. Kasi walo lang yun yung inum. Bakit ilan? Ako ilan? Ha? Gusto mo bang bilangin ko? <laughs> name all the ano? Name all the classes of the antihypertensives. Probably I have. Mm-hmm. Ganong marami. Anyway, uh, well, I guess pwede naman, no? And, uh, but if I have questions, usually I ask my, ano, I ask my, my colleague, for instance, for, for nephrology, no? Mm-hmm. Usually, tatanong ko yung, ano, syempre, hindi ko na maalam yan. Kaya nga, uh, ayan, tinatanong ko, no? And talaga nagko-consult ako regarding doon. Pero hindi sa may diabetes, eh, ano, kumisan, yes. Kung may problema, why not? Pero ang problema kasi is, ano eh, compliance with the, the diet. Yeah. Yun ang mahirap eh. Yun ang mahirap, <laughs> yung willpower. <laughs> so, diba? so, Val, I'll ask a question. What was your yes. merienda earlier? Huwag <laughs> <laughs> mo nang tanongin. Hindi <laughs> lang <laughs> again. Ay, <laughs> Val, di ba nagkaroon ka ng, mm. nagka-COVID ka rin? Tama ba? Yeah, oo. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, ah. Oh, lahat ka, nandiyan lahat. <laughs> so, do you want to ask yes. them about COVID and your uh, risk factors? Yeah, Val. nga eh. Yan na nga eh. Uh, as a COVID, uh, no, no, COVID uh, survivor, I, I would like to ask, why are the people with diabetes uh, vulnerable to COVID? You know? Not only diabetes, siguro, hypertension. Also, not also diabetic, especially uh, those with hypertension or heart problems. And yeah. also, probably uh, those with chronic kidney diseases. No? Yeah. Sige. Simon? Yeah, okay. So, uh, hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. Be- but to tell you the truth, I am looking at data Uh, for the COVID patients, and yes, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, dyslipidemia. And um, I think what makes, it's not just because of the COVID, uh, but they are, because of the multiple risk factors, you are already at risk for another, for a CV event, heart attack and stroke, your immune system is also very low. So it makes you really prone to not just COVID, but pneumonia. I mean, before this COVID uh, happened, our diabetic patients, right? Our diabetic patients, the elderly, were prone to develop pneumonia. And that's why we, you know, we required vaccines, flu shots, uh, pneumonia shots. No, I think it's pretty much, I think the profile of patients uh, with COVID uh, And the profile of patients um, pre-COVID are almost are almost the same in terms of risk factors. So I'm not really sure if we can entirely say that if you have diabetes, you're prone because of the diabetes per se. But it's a it's a play of um, 
multiple uh, multiple factors because COVID does affect the young. No, we see the young patients affected by COVID. They don't have diabetes or hypertension, so maybe it's the immune system also that plays a really big factor in developing COVID. So obviously, if you have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, your immune system isn't exactly normal. It makes you prone to develop uh, any kind of infection. Mike? Yes, as uh, Simon said, uh, most people with diabetes, they have low immune system. So they can easily get infected, not only just with COVID, but any other infection. So with COVID and diabetes, they are a dangerous com uh, combination. One can worsen the other. So if you have uh, high sugar, the infection doesn't heal fast, doesn't get cured. While you have the infection, the sugar tends to get higher, even uh, diabolically high. So... And also, not only people with diabetes, just uh, plain high blood sugar, it's a marker of stress and inflammation that can contribute to adverse metabolic response to infection. And of course, also, you have your stress, which is there, which can release the counter-regulatory hormones like your cortisol, your glucagon, that will elevate the uh, blood sugar. Tsaka ang data, no? pagka diabetic ka and hypertensive uh, and with ischemic heart disease, it's not actually yung being prone ka, mas prone ka magkaroon ng COVID. Eh, no? It's actually mas prone ka maging severe yung COVID mo. No? Yung, yung, uh, magiging, yung severity mo mas taas pagka mas hypertensive ka and diabetic and with ischemic heart disease. So, ang lucky ni Val, no? parang... <laughs> na survive ni Val. Galing Val. Congratulations. <laughs> oo nga eh. Oo nga. <laughs> Hindi, actually, uh, hmm. actually, meron pa kasi ako mga ibang ginagawa eh. Like, for instance, I usually uh, do nasal douche. Ever since, no? Since uh, before, before the pandemic, I've been uh, uh, doing nasal washing twice a day at least. At the most. Uh, three times, four times, no? And probably that's that's a bit helpful for me. Yang, uh, I had very mild symptoms during the the time I had COVID. Kasi controlled naman yung ano mo, no? Val, controlled yung sugar mo at that time. And your... uh, it's a bit high content. Content no, that time. It was 6 point something yung ano ko. Okay. Uh, 6 point 7 at I think. Konti lang naman. <laughs> Meron ba, meron ba tayong, Simon and Mike, about a uh, um, study on mga effect ng vaccine or effect ng diabetes or hypertension or CAD sa vaccine na binibigay, ibibigay ngayon? Meron bang, do you know any data on that? Well, curious lang ko. <laughs> <laughs> alam ba natin, alam na ba kung ano yung dahilan? Kung ano nangyayari? Oo uh, nga eh. With regards to COVID. Is there a parang ano bang tawag doon? Uh, ano bang tawag doon? <laughs> May association. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh. Um, I'm not sure I came across any data on that. Just yeah. that if you're allergic to a certain component of the vaccine, I think that's the only reason why you should worry about getting any vaccine, for example. Yeah. I mean, all of us, we've had our flu shots, right? And when you get the flu shot, your arm hurts, you feel bad, you know. And it's worse when you have some kind of allergic component to part of the, what is this? I forget the component. But if you're allergic to a specific component of that vaccine, then that vaccine may not be for you or... You can still receive vaccine, especially if you're a high-risk patient, but with standby meds for in case you get an allergic reaction. Because what if you do not get the reaction? Um, 
you want to have some kind of protection from COVID because we really don't know the long-term consequences of this COVID. And I tell you, I'm seeing a lot of, I'm, it's a different uh, session, but I'm seeing a lot of things in the heart on cardiac MRI in patients who had recovered from COVID, scarring tissue there, maybe some inflammation. And I, so this is like one month after, two months after, five months after. Some have findings and some don't. And then some are completely asymptomatic and some have symptoms of heart failure and cardiac arrhythmia. So we really don't know the long-term effects. So we want some kind of protection. So if you can lessen your reaction to to the vaccine in terms of anaphylaxis, the vaccine would actually provide some protection versus no protection at all because it's really scary. We don't know what our hearts will look like one year after COVID. And it is this is our one year, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of studies uh, looking at the heart and the long-term effects of COVID, but we, are, we still have to wait and find out what's yeah. going on. But they are seeing something there. Not to scare you, Val, but um, Shemra, we have to be aware of this. And, um, you know, if we're educated on this, then we can pick up the symptoms right away or, you know, screen patients and identify those who may potentially have some risk and, and, and adjust these risks. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Anyway, um, we're almost uh, into one hour already. So, um uh, any last yeah, just, message? Yeah, yeah. I'll just Go add ahead. for well, about uh, diabetes and vaccine. Of course, pa uh, patients with diabetes, we strongly encourage to get the corona, yeah, corona vaccine uh, because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, they're vulner vulnerable to de developing severe illnesses. So, you mentioned about data for COVID vaccine Sorry, and diabetes. It's still new, so we still don't have it yet. So, we're waiting for that. So, but for Val or patient with diabetes, just a reminder, not only for COVID vaccine, but any vaccine. So once we give the vaccine, inject them, the body will elicit an immune response, but this is nothing to worry. Okay, so because the, the body is uh, just reacting to the vaccine, it's new to you because it's foreign. And then, so the body needs energy to produce this uh, immune response. So there'll be release of your uh, counter-regulatory hormones, glucagon, cortisol, etc. So you will expect at least there's a transient rise in your blood sugar. Mm. But nothing to alarm. Don't increase your... Okay. Maybe don't increase your <laughs> insulin requirement. Your medications. Tablets. Yeah, just uh, watch out. Lang. Monitor closely. But I'm not sure if it will happen with this COVID vaccine. We're uh, into one hour already, so um, may I ask Simon and uh, Mike to uh, give their last uh, message for the Filipino people no, with regard to cardiovascular risk factors? Simon. Okay, ladies first. All right. Since it is February month and it's Healthy Heart Day, I'm sorry, Healthy Heart Month, I would like to say that my, my, my takeaway would be to rethink uh, our risk factors. And if, we're, if we have high blood or if we don't have high blood, in, in other words, get our blood pressure at 120 over 80, get our sugars or fasting blood sugar less than 100. Let's get our cholesterol levels under control and let's be adherent to our medications and follow up with our doctors. To prevent uh, another, uh, to reduce our chance of getting a heart attack or a stroke. Thank you, Simon. Mike? Okay, since it's our COVID pandemic, also as I mentioned early, this could be a diabetic pandemic also. So, people will be, we encourage people to stay home, uh, uh, do social distancing. So, when they're staying home, it's not just TV, Netflix, but exercise and also to control your blood sugar, have a good, healthy diet. And then, of course, see your, uh, see your doctor and take your medications regularly. Sige, ikaw, Val, as a patient. Parang... <laughs> and doctor, you have a message for... Actually, also as an ENT. Yeah, okay. Most of my... Uh, actually, 
one of the neglected uh, symptoms is uh, anosmia or probably uh, dysgeusia or any derangement of it of taste no uh, that's one uh, or the most important uh, what they call this symptom that we need to uh, to, uh, to, yeah. to look at whenever we you uh, know we attend patients especially those with uh, suspicious uh, no, no, suspicious uh, is suspicious for covid yeah. okay thank you very that's much all. okay thank you thank you Once again, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Simon Sawit, Dr. Mike Gan, and Dr. Val Garcia, and our uh, classmates also who asked questions, uh, Ejam and Shira. Thank you very much. This has been a, an engaging discussion with regard to cardiovascular risk factors for the Filipino people. So once again, good night, everyone. Stay safe. Finally, Thank you to all of you who joined us tonight. I hope you can join us again on February 24 for our second webisode. I now formally close the first session of our ninth UERM Medical Alumni Association Annual Convention. Good evening and thank you once again. Tune again next week. February 24 at 6 p.m. for the episode Caring for Doki to be chaired by Dr. Alan Anthony Alegre. Make Usapang Buhay Doktor a webcast series, your 6 o'clock habit. Thank you to our virtual host provider, Dr. Carl Balita Review Center's Virtual Interactions, Events, and Conferences, or CBRC Vice. See you again next week.